your average of five people you spend most time with. Yeah. Entrepreneurship requires you to love the product, love the problem that you're solving. While my risk capital is very high, my confidence is very low. So whether you like it or not like it, mm. your brand will be formed. Right. The question is you have to take control mm. of what is the direction that you want to mm. shape. Most leaders should have empty calendar. A lot of people wait for super clarity. कि एक बार जब आइडिया चमक जाएगा तब चालू करेंगे बट बहुत बड़ी फैलसी है मेरे हिसाब से हैव टू स्टार्ट एंड यू हैव टू लर्न बट यू टू पिक दैट एरिया व्हिच इज व्हिच यू आर पैशनेट अबाउट अदरवाइज वो बिना इटरेशन के जस्ट देयर इज नो मैजिकल मोमेंट कि यार एकदम से बन चुका है ऐसा हेलो आई एम मुकेश बंसल Welcome to Sparks. Our guest today is Samir Maheshwari. Samir is a dear friend. We started our career together at Deloitte Consulting in '97. He is the one who introduced me to the world of fitness. We moved back to India around same time to start our respective ventures. Samir is the OG of D2C brands in the country. He built Muscle Blaze, which now has the largest market share and one of the most loved whey protein brands in the country. Samir has deep insights about Indian consumer. He has very slow, thoughtful, methodical approach to building companies. I had so much fun talking to Samir, reminiscing about good old days, as well as exchanging notes on what it takes to build an outstanding brand and outstanding company. I hope you will also enjoy the conversation. Samir, welcome. Hey, man! Super awesome to be here, and super awesome to be connecting back. No, no, you have a very inspiring story, and I'm very fortunate to have known you for you know, almost 25 years now. Yeah. Uh, let me start with you know, you know, health cart is one of the lesser known but phenomenal D2C brand story. Last two three years, D2C has become very hot. You know, people are building D2C aggregators, all the D2C brand and so on. But you've been at it for last at least eight nine years, and uh, health cart and muscle base is over thousand crore brand, profitable, continue grow 30 40 percent annually. 27% market share much bigger than on which is an international brand which has been in india for a long period of time is an outstanding achievement i think through this podcast i'll try to understand your journey exactly how you went about building it quite organically slowly study i think from lot of first principles fundamentals you are like you know so from bodybuilding yourself being a kind of you know quite fit guy to actually eventually choosing a profession in Building, you know, whey protein supplements, etc. Like, how did the whole journey happen? That's a loaded question. Definitely did not plan it this way. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, first of all, amazing to be here, Mukesh. Uh, you have always been an inspiration, and I've followed you uh, significantly. So, so really, really a pleasure to be here. So, going back in time, how did I get into fitness? So, uh, I really got into fitness just around when I got into IIT. So, in IIT, in gym, me, wo There are always like these three, four people who are always in the gym. Max three, four. So, but so I was one of them. Uh, how did I get into this? Is probably I don't know. Maybe got inspired by my maybe people around me who are working out. There are no one working out at IIT. Come on. The IIT के पहले जब तुम देखते हो कि कुछ कुछ लोग यार gym gym जा रहे हैं और bulk up हो रहे हैं. So that is somehow got inspiration there. But IIT में because there was a nice facility there. IIT Delhi में शायद करके है. So I used to go there. And you know, IIT where there's a huge problem of like finding food and all that. Mm-hmm. So basically, I was one of those who'll go to this, uh, uh, get this dud ka pouch and mess ka khana. Logo pasand nahi aata, but I used to eat quite a bit. Uh-huh. So basically, IIT uh, fitness journey started in IIT, and somehow I just stuck to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, when we moved to the US together, and when we were roommates. Uh, this was one thing which I always thought will stay with me, because mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't know. It is a magical element of you know you are always high on fitness, and uh, uh, the big good thing is when I moved to the US, I just realized the facilities were so much more, and I was practically mostly uh, vegetarian while in India. So US ja ke thoda thoda non veg khana jalu kiya aur ek dum se I put on like. Maybe five kgs of muscle mass, so which was quite inspiring. Was that created such a huge complex for me? We are roommate. I was very skinny. If you remember back the time, I was like about sixty kg or something. Yeah, but and you were so, really into sports, though. I remember like you went for cricket match very very early on. Yeah, I was always active, so that way you know, for being active was part and parcel. But I was watching you in like six to nine months. You bulked up. You all these you know bulging biceps and you know triceps and so on. 
and you know you know like how you are in 21 22 you are like you know fomo world is quite now but it has been in our dna since ancient times so i big time fomo but i basically you know followed you i think initially you were also you actually quite guided my fitness journey like initially my gym going started with you and learning no no i remember how- those days and uh, uh, to be honest i distinctly remember this is like we after uh, uh, after uh, basically this was like barrier days right uh, yeah. uh, right eh? so uh, uh, so basically we had both moved to the barrier right. and after that uh, basically we started working out together so i just distinctly remember it was a 2 to 3 month period and i was kind of doing this workout for so many years and i was kind of stagnated and there comes you with full kind of passion ki let's just go and do it and when we started working out together you were so well researched and within 2 to 3 months i distinctly remember i gained like 10 pounds of like muscle mass or whatever i think that compet- was like 3 hours workout every day and <laughs> we were competing on a you know daily basis and i remember like we had this goal of getting to 80 kg right. body weight and we used to drink water to also add <laughs> taking on the vessel water <laughs> two liter water yeah yeah i i think we got into that crazy zone and i distinctly remember i was in consulting i i used to travel for work yeah. and i used to carry my you know shaker and all this together but that was like that was really got into the zone isn't this crazy samir like us work kind of out of passion we are working out and all of that and some way both of us ended up in a fitness business you yeah. know i run gyms now you know building your yeah. this way protein you know business yeah. is just crazy how life unfolds no no it's clearly um, uh, uh, so basically obviously never thought we we'll get into that I never planned it this way but uh, but i think somehow the dots connected and we started health card we found traction in fitness and i was naturally gravitated towards this. so but uh, what's just amazing your passion turns into a <laughs> yeah No, sir. No, I'm having phenomenal fun. I'm sure you are as well. And we'll talk more about that. But actually, let me ask you some questions we never asked you before. You know, let's just go even more back. You know, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up? You know, how were you like growing up? You know, and yeah. maybe you'll reflect on you know what are some of the childhood experience might have shaped you. Your yeah. yeah. four into bodybuilding and you know the entrepreneurial choices you made and so on. Like, is there anything looking back you are yeah. able to see in yourself? You know, that was part of your. childhood experience yeah yeah so nothing shaped my uh, passion for fitness when i grew up but uh, so i grew up in jaipur yeah. and uh, grew up in a classic marwadi middle class family and uh, my dad uh, uh, used to be an income tax consultant he's a ca so so basically a classic marwadi family mm-hmm. uh, filled with lot of cas they only talk about business and money so you somehow you get uh, you know this indirect mm-hmm. uh, and then there was obviously middle class values of working hard and basically doing all the things right putting all the effort and all that was in green but we were also uh, encouraged to take some initiatives and i distinctly remember like one incident uh, not incident one episode which which def- definitely had a long term impact so you know how these dashera melas happen yeah, yeah. तो सो बेसिकली वी पार्टिसिपेट इन दशहरा मेला मेला पेरेंट्स सेट की करो करो कुछ करो एंड दशहरा मेले में यू नो पूरा पूरी मोहल्ला आता है और इतने सारे मतलब एक रावण जलता है और साइड में बहुत सारे स्टॉल्स रहते हैं आई डोंट नो इफ यू अरे बस में बहुत राउंड बनाए भी तो हजो बोला नहीं यार कुछ करो पेरेंट्स ने बोला कि तुम जाके स्टॉल वगैरह लगाओ तो बोला हाँ चलो करते हैं कुछ तो बेसिकली हम चार दोस्तों ने एक फ्रूट चाट की स्टॉल है तो इन वर्जन ऑफ लेमोनेड स्टैंड एग्जैक्टली एग्जैक्टली तो फिर बेसिकली ये था कि अब बेसिकली ये स्टॉल लगाई और फिर था कि कुछ ना कुछ याद करेंगे और सुपर हिट होनी चाहिए तो उसके पहले क्या होता था उसमें सिस्टम ये था कि आप घर घर जाके टिकट बेच करेक्ट तो वो रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी मेरी आगे तो अब इमेजिन करो कि यार पहले तो दशहरा मेला में कौन जाएगा उसके बाद उसके पहले से तो मुझसे चार्ज कर लो वर्से तो वही जाके खरीद ले तो आई डिस्टिंगली रिमेम्बर तो मैं फिर उसमें क्या वो काफी शर्म वरम भी आती है यार इसके घर जाओ नॉक करो बट आई वॉज लाइक वेरी ड्रिवन तो मैं एक एक घर पे आता था कई बार तो होता है ना दूर से अंकल कोई आ गया कोई तो नहीं है <laughs> but but you know this is like just an example but i was very persistent i would go or uncle bol rahe beta wahi to aage le lenge bola nahi nahi uncle ek to lena hi padega so as a kar karke we pretty much i sold out major tickets overall 
एंड देन वेन वी वर एट द स्टॉल बेसिकली जैसे प्रोडक्ट तो मैंने बनाया नहीं था तो फूड चार्ट था और कोई और ही बना रहा था फिर उसके बाद वहाँ पे भी जाके जब स्टॉल पे कुछ और बेचना पड़ा तो वहाँ पे भी लोग पकड़ पकड़ के तो बेसिकली द होल आइडिया इज वी एक्चुअली एट स्ट्रीटेड मेम्बर वी मेड लाइक टू थाउजेंड रुपीज अमंग्स फोर पीपल and then those days like i made 500 rupees which was uh, you know just gives you a sense of you know what it takes and thoda sa aapki jhijhak nikal jati hai all this so get you in that zone so we we as a family were uh, all, that marwadi environment mm. was always that right uh, which i think certainly has a indirect and underpinning and uh, that, that that is how it was but basically look uh, growing up we were all surrounded by cas my dad is a ca my brother is a ca uncles are ca to wo classic tha ki bhai tum bhi chartered accountant ban jao aur kuch kuch karna but uh, i am always i always was very independent and i always get excited about you know certain new things and all that so uh, when i got exposed to science and all that i really developed a lot of interest and i was like you know yaar iit bada interesting lag raha hai one of my uncles had gone through iit program hmm. so I got really excited कि यार बहुत ही एक्साइटिंग है अकाउंटिंग हो जाए मे बी नॉट यू नो दैट फन सो दैट्स वाई बेसिकली आई जस्ट प्रो एक्टिवली चोज साइंस स्ट्रीम एंड देन द साइंस वॉज सो इंटरेस्टिंग टू बी ऑनेस्ट लाइक लॉट ऑफ पीपल क्रिप की यार ये आई आई टी में इतना पढ़ना पड़ा ये पढ़ना पड़ा बट टू बी ऑनेस्ट दैट प्रिपरेशन दैट वी डिड इट वॉज लाइक ऑलमोस्ट सॉल्विंग प्रॉब्लम्स एंड यू नो डिस्कवरिंग दैट सो आई रियली हैड फन एंड आई वॉज फॉर्चुनेट टू गेट थ्रू तो तो बेसिकली दैट इज अमेजिंग या आई कैन ऑलरेडी सी लॉट ऑफ डॉट्स कनेक्टिंग फ्यूचर आई नो लाइक इन बिटवीन यू नो यू एक्चुअली वर्क इन सेल्स यू नो बिफोर स्टार्टिंग हेल्थ कार्ड सो यू हैड अ ट्रेनिंग एज अ सेल्स पर्सन यू नो वेरी अर्ली इन चाइल्डहुड फैमिली ऑफ यू नो अकाउंटेंट आई नो लाइक यू आर वेरी वेरी रिग्रेस अबाउट नंबर्स यू नो जस्ट स्टडी यू आर टॉकिंग एंड यू आर लाइक जस्ट स्पॉट ऑन इन टू नंबर साइट्स सो प्राइज एक्चुअली क्वाइट फैसिनेटिंग हाउ लॉट ऑफ आर चाइल्डहुड एक्सपीरियंसिस दैट वी डोंट रियलाइज बट लॉट ऑफ आर लेटर जर्नी यू नो एंड अप somehow informed by that and one of the things you know we talk in this podcast about people to just reflect on how was your childhood experience you know what your natural propensity were yeah. what you gravitated towards what you didn't like yeah. chances are those traits are still there That's right. and you can you know over index on that as opposed to trying to blend in and do you know what other yeah. people are doing right yeah, yeah. so no, i think we end up reflecting back i wish uh, we would have reflected sooner <laughs> and kind of built upon some of these trends but absolutely right there are always these traits which are visible <laughs> Excellent. So let's uh, go back to late nineties. So you were quite adventurous by the time. I know you were always up for new experiences, experimenting. You had long hair. Long hair. <laughs> Definitely a very distinct body. Which is a which is a very different <laughs> scene now. <laughs> Things change over the years. So yeah. You were decades between that and now. Speak of which, I think so. You tried, you know, so we started your career in consulting. Like um, both of us started together in consulting, and then you, I think, from if I remember, you moved to Bay Area and you joined a sales job. Right, right. What was the like? Just what thought was behind, you know? Right, right. Sales. So basically, look, consulting. Uh, you obviously also we worked together at Deloitte. So when we joined consulting, the idea was like st- just trying to get into the US, try to understand how consulting works. So consulting was fun for uh, absolutely fun because look, basically getting to uh, getting deep into technology, understanding how technology solutions are provided. But ultimately, just realized that Bay Area was where the action was mm-hmm. in terms of technology. so uh, uh, you moved to the bay area and then i was also looking to sort of plug myself into the bay area where basically you get to and then the thing was i obviously wanted to work for a product company mm. because product company allows you to go deep so uh, got an opportunity to work with one such company moved there and uh, there also basically i just realized uh, you know in tech companies also there are different roles you can do software programming you can do product management you can do sales yeah. and uh, uh some I, uh, i landed in sales mm-hmm. and it was uh, it was a really good fit because um, uh you are able to not only tie your technology experience mm-hmm. but also the sales experience so combination really gives you that independence and mm-hmm. li- little bit of an entrepreneurial feel to this so uh, allowed me to uh, so basically it was not very well thought out we just wanted to go so and what, try were you good at sales i remember you being very intense i think you were very focused and i think you were in pre sales for some time i remember yeah, so yeah, which yeah. requires you know putting to as demos you know pretty yeah, quickly yeah, and yeah. i could see that whenever you interact you know just yeah. out of intensity so did it translate into 
good outcome no no absolutely so uh, i think it was a transformational experience for me uh, because uh, typically when you think about sales you, you just like have this view that people just go and kind of say you know there's a sabun bechne wali feel aati hai ki aap tum ja ke kisi ko sabun bech rahe ho kar but uh, but basically in uh, enterprise sales is quite tricky in my view because uh, if you go into the science of sales there are three or four sort of people who are going to sign up on an enterprise sale mm-hmm. which could budget you know the budgets are like a million dollars yeah. so basically you really need to get navigate this and you really need to have the right strategy for between like a pre sales and sales you will divide and conquer yeah. so uh, so basically uh, you know i used to bring the expertise of understanding technology and kind of demonstrating the solution yeah. and then the other sales partner will sort of navigate through the budget process right. but then you really have to also you know kind of navigate the system right. so it was amazing experience and uh, uh, lots of uh, fun things where you really work hard you have very little resources yeah. uh, and somehow you are able to beat the biggest and uh, the best yeah. and i think that gives you a lot of confidence in terms of very very entrepreneurial uh, so i really had a lot of fun doing that so you were like a star sales person huh? meeting all your i quota. was i was part of the quota club which right. is that uh, top 5 10% of people uh, year on year right. so i was consistently delivered amazing how, and how long do you do this sales job so basically uh, i uh, uh, worked with this company for 5 years okay. out of this 3 to 4 years for sales okay amazing so you know that's i think if you get to i mean anyway you started very early selling fruit salad in your you know high school <laughs> I was recently talking to Nitin Kamath and he was talking about how his call center experience taught him so many lessons about sales. There is, I mean some ways in life we are always selling, you know, yeah. the whatever we are doing you as an entrepreneur you are selling to investors and employees to join obviously selling yeah. your product to customers so yeah. I think must have been a great experience with four or five years really getting hardcore so sales. So look in US uh, 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 so frankly speaking when I was transitioning to sales uh, I got a lot of uh, uh, informal advice that you know because the sweet spot of all Uh, all the people going from iits and yeah. india is like basically stick to either technology or right. product basically so it was slightly a riskier move that we were like ki, because look uh, you uh, in india you feel very comfortable uh, right. but in us basically it's a different uh, uh, you know different you know different sort of uh, 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 different setup mm-hmm. so basically there's a little bit of learning curve to get over the hump of uh, you know uh, are you too conscious on this right. so basically it really pushed you um, uh, and it was i think it was really fun experience and definitely had a uh, lot of indirect sort of learning mm-hmm. uh, so in like your 20s you know you were uh, just um, at some level you were quite focused on your career whatever you were doing you were doing it with full intensity and commitment and hard work and so on but yet simultaneously you were also pursuing your own interest definitely you know fitness was one big interest for you at that time um just do you remember being you know in 20s you were kind of calm and self assured and you know or you were anxious and you know willing to go somewhere really fast so uh, so to be honest look we are uh, in 20s you are discovering yourself so what i uh, figured about myself was uh, I I was really dedicated to work and I enjoyed the process of work. So basically let's say you're working on a sales deal and you'll completely immerse yourself and you put your 100%. But at the same time I was also uh, realized that I always needed some new things where I can push my boundary on dimensions which I was not exposed to. So fitness kind of stayed as a kind of battle hobby but I was looking to kind of learn about the product, get into something else. and that is why basically i had this anchoring in my mind that i always wanted to go to a business school mm. and business school would be that one a platform where you can take a break and maybe uh, spend good dedicated 2 yeah. years to kind of just you know right. maybe chill and maybe learn right. <laughs> dedicated me and then you can basically figure out what you want to do right. so uh, frankly speaking i uh, i always had this business school uh, okay. thing uh, uh, ever since i moved to the us okay. but then basically uh, maybe like the work too much and mm-hmm. maybe the whole uh, tech boom was happening uh, but i definitely wanted to go to the business school at some point of time and that was my way of sort of moving that i think i want to you know just build on that because uh, i know a lot of people who are watching this are you know early in their career and people in their 20s you know sometimes there are a lot of question marks 
and confusion and sometimes you know <clears throat> by the time people are 25 they feel like you know life is running past them you know they have not arrived yet but if i look at your journey you know i think couple of things standing out one is whatever you are doing you are doing it with full commitment you know you are i mean you are part of very large organization so it's not like as a in early career you have huge empowerment or you have access to the company strategy or you know you still uh, you know you are uh, trying to fit in the larger scheme of things yet you were you know working hard trying to make the most impact and which is would have you know help you get noticed in the organization i'm sure it helped you also later on to get to business school that we'll talk about and yet you know whatever other time you were exploring you were trying to find yourself you know pushing your boundaries yeah. i think that seems like almost a pretty reasonable template to follow in 20s you know find something do it really well push yourself in that you know not small wins and yet also you know keep an open mind you know don't get too committed to something you know try different directions right i mean that's a so i don't know whether it's so by design by accident but you know seems like pretty good way to you know no but definitely not look if anybody says that this has happened by design they are just <laughs> not telling the truth look all of us or all the people in 20s are exploring and that is what they need to do so i think sometimes uh, uh, it is just a discovery process of figuring out what your core uh, strengths are yeah. uh, and basically not trying to chase somebody else's goals yeah. i think that i i think that is what i feel is important and the other thing is look uh, sometimes you're so engrossed in the process you lose track of time mm-hmm. which is what also happens right. to me some to, to some degree yeah. so uh, my recommendation is look basically you should definitely be honest to uh, your own self and find your own strengths but definitely uh, have some objective goals mm-hmm. so that you don't uh, you know Uh, spend way too much time on something which can <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i think i think you think also keep in mind in 20s is really that that's also discovery phase i mean the careers are made over 3 or 4 decades yeah so there's so much time ahead i mean even say in 20s also i had the i definitely had that feeling ki you know things are happening you know by the time late 20s this feeling ki kuch nahi ho raha you know whatever i'm trying nothing is working i had a sense you know when much much later i realized that you know that is too short of a time frame uh and just you know just using the time for primarily for the learning vehicle and also developing some core skills in your case you know just even working hard on something you know in a uh, focused manner is a skill uh sales is definitely a skill so but you had you had clarity also that you want to do business school i also at the same time i didn't have full clarity but some vague desire so also i had a question for you oh, okay. <laughs> i think you asked very very relevant questions and i in fact i'm very curious to hear your answer because uh, uh you know from what i remember uh you always were the risk taker right and you were ahead of the curve in terms of thinking on how the future will sort of shape up you were very well informed and all this so basically this whole question around we are in a hurry right to quickly do things and look if you think about it like we all transitioned from yeah. from india to a different country right. uh we were doing this first job in deloitte and after that basically uh, we all moved to the bay area you you uh, what was your thought process were you always uh, kind of feeling that you are uh, wasting too much of time and you want to do things quickly and how did you like sort of manage that i think so some of it is a retrospective you know thinking right so i do, i won't have this language to describe in 20s but i think what is going on is when is i've had this intense curiosity again it goes back to childhood I was very very curious i'm still curious i really want to understand things you know a little bit of even how why this podcast is happening i really want to understand you know how people who create exponential impact what is their journey what different journeys look like so the curiosity is a big part of it hence you know i used to always read you know i used to just keep me informed about different things second is also i think i had a huge comfort with risk i didn't realize and you know some things that we'll probably not talk about in this <laughs> podcast but i, I was, can if you want <laughs> uh, not today to we'll save it for later yeah but uh, so i had that comfort with risk you know i just for example you know first job that we started together yeah just lent one fine day i felt like mere ko maza nahi aa raha yahan pe yeah to quit the job drove to your area try to start a company right yeah. and it was for me it didn't even feel like a risk yeah. it's like if i felt like i want to do it i was able to do it without worrying too much about consequences yeah now that's a definite double edged sword you know every time you take risk the bigger the risk the you can also fall very hard right but i had that you know some of the comfort and i stayed true to that so i think the credit i'll give myself is that i didn't hold myself back and a lot of those risks did not work out you know i had mm. in 20s lot of failures you know i think some you are aware of yeah but 
for me the sense of adventure thrill accelerated learning yeah. was more than the potential setback and actually real setback also yeah. Yeah. speaking of real setback right you know coming back to uh, you know our mid 20s i think around the same time i also said thinking about business school but mera it was like again you know just very short term thinking ki aaj is mood bana ki ab business ko karna chahiye to jaldi jaldi gmat karo and all of that and obviously as a result you know didn't get into any good school while you got into howard business school which is basically you know the aspects of business school one can go to yeah. so how was the whole experience you know how did those two years went for you what did you learn you think retrospect you know has has that experience played a big role in so i uh, so basically if i think about look i always think about if you reflect back what are the best memories yeah. that you had and 9 out of 10 people who have gone to iit definitely iit would be that period and that is clearly true for uh, everyone who has gone through it it's just you get independent such a garden ecosystem and learning environment just amazing uh, but definitely this whole hbs experience was game changing for me uh, and i'll tell you the reason the two years was so amazing and there was nothing like uh, what the hype was yeah. so essentially uh, i i really feel basically what happened is uh, i am also a believer if you surround yourself with a ecosystem of highly motivated people it really ups your game right right so it really uh, without knowing uh, subconsciously you yeah. start to sort of uh, act in that manner and the two years were amazing you meet amazing people and extremely ambitious people but at the same time uh people are pushing each other to kind of find themselves right. uh, uh, so basically business school was amazing i will definitely not trade lot of people say oh would you take this much of a loan to go to this business school now that i was like you know there's one life yeah. and treat this like an experience and uh, i would i would have not done it any other way so outstanding amazing. i think the one thing you said is surrounding yourself by really really smart driven ambitious people i think that's also very important i really like this quote which says you are average of five people you spend most time with yeah. and yeah. we absorb so much with the people you know around us i obviously did not go to business school but silicon valley is again you know yeah. very high concentration of yeah. highly driven ambitious people you know every tom dick and harry think he will invent something will change the world yeah. and then after five years maybe he actually did you know yeah. so many examples of you know doing yeah. from my time in bear and where delhi one story it's uh, i was just almost embarrassed to tell the story but uh, in uh, 99 you know when i moved to mountain view uh one of my um uh, roommate's friend was doing phd at stanford and uh, one day you know we were all you know meeting for lunch he came back from stanford he saying you know he went to this uh, some demo day equivalent at stanford and there's a couple of other phd students they are building this search engine yeah. and uh, in those in we had yahoo um the lycos the yeah. bunch of you know so many search engines and i remember kind of laughing you know ये सर्च इन क्यों बनाना है इतने सारे तो ऑलरेडी है सब कुछ से मिलता है राइट एंड ऑब्वियसली इज यू नो नो गेसिंग व्हाट दैट कंपनी वाज राइट बट यू नो सो यू सी यू नो अगेन अगेन सो आई थिंक द पॉइंट इज कॉन्शियसली चूजिंग टू पुट योरसेल्फ इन एनवायरमेंट वेयर यू आर सीकिंग आउट पीपल हु आर मच स्मार्टर देन यू दैट विल डू अमेजिंग थिंग टू योर माइंडसेट योर थिंकिंग यू नो द चॉइसेस यू विल मेक व्हाट यू ऑब्जर्व राइट इट्स अ समटाइम people may not put lot of attention to who i'm spending time with yeah and bangalore is now evolving to be one such like there is a you know hot bed of startup activity in fact hsr layout you know we are very close to hsr layout yeah there are hundreds of startups if not thousands here right yeah. and therefore the concentration of you know talent ambition starting to happen here yeah yeah absolutely um, and i am a big believer but uh, look uh, let me ask you this when you moved here in 2007 yeah did you miss that uh, ecosystem 100% you know for 5 6 years i did mm. but slowly slowly the ecosystem started to happen i could see a lot of people started moving back you know yeah. in fact among my friends you moved back 2 yeah. years later yeah. you know mukri and their close friend he moved back you know to start amazon in india at mintra we were able to actually recruit a lot of people from bay area and one thing yeah. i feel really good about in 2011 yeah. to 2014 period we recruited a lot of people from bay area eventually when you know as flipkart we actually start recruiting from google in bay area wow so i'll go for recruitment trips and say you know that's and awesome feeling like you know india has arrived you know we had a value proposition flipkart was obviously doing you know pioneering yeah. things and we are able to sell the story so i think yes i think e- ecosystem was sparse at that time yeah. but then you know for me the other thing kicks in you know this is a wild wild west kind of thing you know yeah. whole open white space india is taking off so there's a lot absolutely. of excitement for that absolutely right. so you what did you do after hbs you know did you start you had an entrepreneurship right away or yeah. you work somewhere so look uh, hbs was where this whole entrepreneurship bug took yeah. uh, got me 
And first of all, in business school, uh, you know, this is the first time I realized there are so many other professions like consulting, banking, mm. private equity and all that. I, I had no idea. I was like living this, uh, there's only tech. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that is where basically I got really excited. And then you... Uh, got uh, you also learn so much uh, macro like mm -hmm. what's happening in this country that country so I really got excited about you know India's prospects uh, and uh, I did uh, uh, what used to be a field study or something mm -hmm. that I did a business plan based on India and I was really tempted to sort of move back to India right after mm -hmm. uh, in fact I temporarily moved for three months I said. but my biggest learning is uh, without full commitment, <laughs> you know, these things never work. So I actually came uh, in 2007 for two, three months. I tried, uh, the, you know, partially committed. But then I had the uh, security of going back. Uh, so I decided to build my resume a little bit. Okay. So moved back to the Bay Area uh, and uh, worked for an investment bank. So you did so the same thing and then you went so back. So basically, look, I was not 100% uh, committed uh, because I always had this question. I was trying to maintain this option value. And uh, we had this, uh, so basically decided to move back to the Bay Area and worked for UBS Investment Bank. And Investment Bank, the thing was, uh, uh, it was obviously, you know, it's like the thing to do. Yeah. And also I had taken this as a challenge. I used to hear that people have to work like 80, 100 hours a mm. week. How do they sustain? Right. I was like, you know, uh, finance was new to me. I was like, you know, let's go and do yeah. it. But then I realized, look, it works like a magic for a lot of mm. people. But uh, I was looking for a lot more creativity. So we used to do these a uh, lot of Excel models. And right. I used to, uh, I was part of the technology coverage group. So essentially, you used to advise technology companies mm. in terms of their capital raising and, right. and all this. So um, so you really got good at like, you know, modeling and figuring out the data and all this. Uh, but basically, it used to work like a... Uh, so, so I was missing the creativity and understanding one level deeper because you can easily model like gross margins will move from X to Y. Yeah. But what really drives that gross margin was a question that I was right. discovering. Mm -hmm. So I kept going back to this whole idea, this whole entrepreneurial thing never got out of the system. Right. Mm -hmm. So despite of working 80, 100 hours a week, which is like practically sometimes you not long? even come back. But is it, was it one year? Two years. Two years. Two years. So that's what so, proved 2006 to 8. Uh, this was uh, 2007 to 9. Awesome. So in the middle of the financial so crisis. So that, is, that was one thing which uh, made me believe that. Uh, uh, so basically the whole thing was, I kept going back to this whole idea of entrepreneurship. And I used to talk to people that, you know, kuch karte hai, India chalte hai, and all this while doing all this 80 yeah. crazy hours uh, in banking. And then I'm, I also have this trait that I have very little patience for mm. when people just talk, talk, talk right. and don't do things. Mm. <laughs> so, so you know how this is in Bay Area once you stay or lived in the US for 10, 12 years, people will have this cocktail right. discussion, oh, India is happening, let's do this. <laughs> yeah. But the reality is, look, every by every passing year, yeah. your opportunity cost goes up and you have more liabilities. Yeah. And it is very, very unlikely right. that you will be able to do this. So basically in 2000, Eight nine we uh, uh, so two thousand eight our son was born, and my wife was also going through the business school there, and at that point I just realized that uh, either the move is going to happen now mm. or basically we'll just stay happily right. in the U.S. Right. And uh, obviously I was all following your trajectory that you had gone and started a company in India. It was very exciting. So that is where basically I decided to pull the plug and moved here in two thousand nine. I think, and that's, uh, I know uh, pulling the plug is not easy. Uh, yeah. 2006, when I was thinking of building Mintra, the so same thing, you know, I talked to my colleagues there, ki India chalte hai, company hai, all of that. Yeah. And two people agreed to be initial co-founders. And then we all pl started planning, ki kab and all that. And then, like for me, I decided to finish, resign, kar de, all of that, started planning. And very close to that, both of informed me, ki, yaar, abhi nahi <laughs> we are not ready, ye, wo, like, <laughs> then I said, okay, okay, I'll just go ahead anyway and see, you know, so. No, but people don't realize it. I think, uh, frankly speaking, this letting go of the option yeah. value Correct. is actually quite big. Yeah, uh, This is true everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I, I also feel that, uh, you know, ultimately it's just that uh, commitment to one cause yeah. and letting go of option value makes all the difference. I think so. Let's just a little bit of, you know, maybe underline that part, right? Is because I think I know a lot of people listening to this will probably have entrepreneurial ambition and so on. But at some point, making the call, letting go of something, you know, literally a bird in hand for who knows, you know, 100 in bush or zero in bush, right? You don't know what is going to happen. But I think finding that uh, able to let go and reducing your option at some point, yeah. when people can keep growing options, they can hedge and all of that, that also works to a point until you have some kind of uh, safety nest and confidence and skills. 
at some point one has to let go of a lot of options otherwise you will not be able to fully double down and figure out you know yeah. what you can find. so i 100% agree with that in fact a lot of people when they informally ask me uh, uh you know i'm working in this company that company and maybe i'll do this after yeah. this but frankly speaking entrepreneurship doesn't require any such skill yeah. uh so entrepreneurship requires you to love the product love the problem that you're solving and for that your passion and persistence is the only thing yeah. and none of the companies can teach that right. so uh while we keep procrastinating because we are uh, but but the problem is with procrastination with every year your opportunity cost will keep increasing yeah and also you will become too analytical yeah. <laughs> and uh, and my view uh, risk and just rewards uh, for entrepreneurship is very low mm -hmm. so once people analyze it too much it just uh, so while i <laughs> i want you know I absolutely agree that there's probably no age you know you can probably be an entrepreneur at the age of 20 or the age of 50 and there are many examples of both and every age factor in between so if someone has the uh confidence and courage to start in their early 20s they can they can and there are many examples that they are as successful as you know, people in their more experience but there is also something to be said about uh, just mental preparedness and some financial stability if you work yeah. for you know 5 or 10 years yeah. you can have probably you know bank balance that can support you for 2 3 years some basic you know uh, family obligations are taken That's care of also sometimes confidence you know depend on where you come from you know you were selling fruit salad you know in high school <laughs> i had you know while my risk capital is very high my confidence is very low <laughs> like you know always used to like think of ki mere se nahi hoga you know that's a and that confidence never was, never felt like that how many times able to <laughs> mask it somehow <laughs> but i had very deep you know insecurities you know took long time to get over so having some financial stability some confidence some success under belt knowing some people i mean those are also intangibles the problem is look with the problem with financial stability is you will never know how much is the right stability yeah. So my rule of thumb now is, if I look back, uh, I feel that you need to have a runway for two years, two years, two years and great, you should yeah. not compromise your day-to-day -day lifestyle for right. two years. Yeah, uh, because look, it's a tough journey, yeah. right? You will have obligation to your family, you will have obligation to you know your investors or whatever. So you need to give a clear runway for two years, yeah. and then if it doesn't work out in two years, then you need to be honest. And while it is very very difficult to <laughs> work out, but uh, the questions both of us agree on that. You know, we can probably you know uh, just highlight that as you know kind of first formal tool for you know people who are thinking of starting entrepreneurs, create it towards your runway two years. so that you can you know work at something peacefully and don't. compromise on the lifestyle while you're pursuing that 2 to 3 years i think yes. that is quite important <laughs> or at least you know reasonable lifestyle reasonable lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i mean reasonable yeah. <laughs> right right so okay so you worked at ubs and uh, any skills you think you developed during your ubs career as well which you know might have come in handy for you later so i i think banking one big takeaway is the work ethics yeah. so basically i distinctly remember there were few nights you will not come back Right, so basically you're working non-stop, thirty-six hours, forty-eight hours, or whatever. That's not work ethic. <laughs> no, no, no. work exploitation. So no, but I'll tell you. Uh, uh, so even today, uh, so one big takeaway is obviously on a on a lighter note. When I am using Excel, I don't need to use the mouse. Mm. So I have all the shortcut keys right. and all that. So uh, so this is one takeaway that every backer will have. Uh, but on a uh, on, I think it teaches you a little bit of perfection mm. uh, because while uh, you know it's very quick to sort of analyze information and jump to conclusion, but in banks, basically, you know, even if we had one small formatting error on a PowerPoint, right. literally uh, the 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 MD will like throw the presentation at you. <laughs> so so basically, you know, while while it is uh, you know uh, while you can say the culture is bad or whatever. it teaches you uh, it is designed to teach you a little bit of perfection right. because you have to be detail oriented and all that mm. and that has stuck to me right. uh, uh, so while now i can let go of a lot of formatting errors but internally i always think that this should be so basically it teaches you work ethics that you will go the extra mile to make sure uh, that you are detail oriented right. and all this so that, i think that was a big tick up amazing also i'm guessing you know two years analyzing all these um, financial statements various companies you probably really deeply understood you know how to read cash flow statements and yeah. p&l statement and yeah. balance sheet and so on because a lot of entrepreneurs you know don't know that or don't learn much earlier but you know you even before you started you know yeah. 
you already probably had deep understanding of how to read financials, you know, how to analyze financials, see patterns and so on. And you obviously had the you know, sales experience, you know, those two. So I think it's a combination of business school yeah. because business school also teaches you that. Right. So you at least are very savvy in terms of understanding financials and all that. And, uh, and as a investment bank, you certainly are able to understand them uh, quite a bit. But uh, these are skills that you can pick. I would not over-index them. Yeah. Uh, but basically, uh, you need to have basic understanding though. Uh, and definitely add that. So you were in banking in 2008 when the financial meltdown was happening. I mean, it's yeah. probably, you know, worst time the financial, you know, sp in the services industry would have seen. Yeah. Did it affect you or UBS? You know, what was your only... No, no. So clearly, look, basically, in fact, uh, that also became a good trigger point because, uh, you know, banking, I got into banking because I was really excited about finance because finance is something that I was learning for the first time right. in business school. And I had the best grades in finance. And <laughs> so basically, I got uh, into this and became a challenge that let's work for this. But then it was also this whole promise of this will pay you a lot. You can pay off your debt and all this. Mm -hmm. And then when this whole crisis happened, and it was very clear that, uh, you know, basically the whole industry was going through a shift. Mm -hmm. So and I realized this was not going to be a long term for, right. for me overall. So after two years at UBS, you know, you quit your job and decided to move to India. Can you just quickly... Then we recollect your thought process, you know, how did you arrive at the decision and then multiple decisions simultaneously, you know, quitting your job, starting as an entrepreneur, moving back to India. Like what is, you know, just how long was, is the, did you think about it for a long period of time or the decision were able to take fairly quickly? So basically, look, the thought process was going on uh, since I started banking mm -hmm. uh, because I, I was constantly thinking because we had done this business plan and mm -hmm. temporarily for two, three months. Right. So I thought this journey is going to be a lot more exciting. Mm. And I kept missing that uh, insights that I was looking into business. So basically, look, uh, banking was fun, but I was constantly going back to this. And that's my learning. Look, whatever you do, yeah. that 100% commitment is extremely required. Otherwise, you know, you just right. can't sustain. So basically, kept talking to people, kept talking to people. And then basically, then I realized then uh, when Siddharth was born, mm. we just realized that basically uh, it's going to be difficult year on year. Right. And my wife was also going through business school. Uh, so basically, we were like, uh, uh, let's just rush this out of the system. And uh, I uh, was friends with Prashant, who was also looking to move back to India. Right. And that is where basically found, found the co-founder right. that I was looking for. And then basically we, uh, we said like he was committed to move and I was looking to move. And basically just time it worked out. I was like, let's just pull the plug. Let's give it a shot. Let's flush it out. Hmm. Otherwise, had the pedigree to basically find yeah. a job. Uh, and that. you guys had the clarity about what you wanted to start, or you wanted more clarity about start karna, karna ke baad making So basically, uh, uh, Prashant was working at McKinsey at that point of time, and he was part of the healthcare practice. I had mostly worked in tech and even in financial services, mostly focused on tech companies. So basically, we just decided we'll do something in health and tech. Okay. That was about it. And typically, like a consulting or a banking, the paper was absolutely on the, uh, the the plan was absolutely on the paper. And, you know, we'll do this, 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 so many things. And we had no <laughs> no resources. Right. We were just putting our own <laughs> savings onto yeah. it, right? So basically, plan was on paper. Uh, but we knew that we'll do something in health and tech. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started with a model which was basically creating a software platform for, for physicians. Mm -hmm. And eventually, we wanted to plug in online pharmacies. Right. So, so that is how we started and it kind of morphed. Uh, so you had a, you know, uh, an banking business school background, so you know, Prashant. Did you have a reasonable understanding of, you know, time and how big this can be or so on? Or uh, you just, it was more of a idea that you guys liked? So uh, obviously everything was on paper. Uh, even in banks, we used to basically write these. Uh, so I was part of some of these IPO processes yeah. where you do these mm -hmm. S1 drafting. So you talk about this time and all this, but this is such a top-down approach, uh, which in my view is actually irrelevant for yeah. a lot of startups because ultimately it comes down to bottoms-up approach in terms of how many customers will use your right. product and all that. So we had this uh, nice because we had done business plans in mm. business school also. So there was no challenge on <laughs> defining that time mm. and you could make up, you know, uh, position the idea because we always knew that, look, health and tech at a high level mm will become big and was always yeah. big. Mm. But if you wanted to take a, uh, you know, online view of things, yeah. it could be small, but eventually the problem mm. was in general big. So that was the... 
So you were convinced the market size because the reason I'm asking is I mean even today I think you know building a software platform for doctors I think market still very very tiny. Yeah. <laughs> right. So was it like you know was your analysis like way off the mark? Yeah. So I would say it was theoretical mm -hmm. uh, because look frankly speaking when we move back and you would have uh, known the same thing in 2009 there were no smartphones. Right. There was no internet adoption. So I, I I'll tell you the story. So uh, so we started this. And we were down the trenches, living in US, we were like, you know, flying business class and all this, like completely ground right? So basically, there was no smartphones, there was no computer usage even. So basically, we convinced the doctor to convince him that he used to use it. So the doctor was sitting there, he was going to go 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 there. Then basically, we convinced the doctor to say, he said, you have a laptop too, and you have a software. So we have to buy a laptop and you have to use it. Then what happened? ये डॉक्टर बिल्कुल मतलब बिजी पार्ट ऑफ डेली में था इनकी प्रैक्टिस और हम दूर रहते तो वो बिल्कुल एकदम से फोन आता था अरे यार लैपटॉप चिंच चल ही रहा तो मैंने क्या हम वहाँ पे एक घंटा ड्राइव करके उधर जाते थे बोलते बताओ यार क्या हुआ तो कभी कोई इसका नेटवर्क कभी इंटरनेट नहीं so while our plan was on paper, but the reality was the curve was still the critical mass was just not there. So basically, there was a disconnect in terms of how we were thinking and what was the ground reality. <laughs> this reminds me of a similar story. I think 2007-8. Uh, so we were trying to raise money, etc., for Mintra and uh, you know go to a lot of these wealthy individuals. I'm not going to name <laughs> this person, but uh, we met one such person. And we explained that, sir, we will send online, people will come to the website, we will add a cart and order, and then we will get the money at home. So, how will the payment be? How will the payment be through credit card? So, he pulled out, you know, he pulled out his, he had a desktop, and he pulled out his credit card. Where will you put the credit card in the computer? For the payment for the day. <laughs> but he did give us money. <laughs> so that's that funny. Uh, those are early days of e-commerce. No, no, no. <laughs> Fortunately, changed viewers down the line. And so cool. So you moved and you and Prashant moved back. So you were two two co-founders. Yeah, yeah, we were two co-founders. And uh, how did you know first year, first few years, went for you guys? So I think look, uh, one thing that really worked for us is look, we moved here in two thousand nine, and we started working on this. And we both had the pedigrees and obviously like, we got out of our comfort zone. We were practically working out of, uh, you know, my friend's, friend's place, a dining table with three people sitting there, and then someone was delivering a car, so I was going to deliver a car and deliver a car. So basically it was like down the trenches. Mm. But uh, uh, obviously the business was not going anywhere. Mm. Uh, and we had spent almost a year, year and a half eye trading through this. Uh, and thoda side mein fir consulting bhi karna chaadu kar diya ki ya thoda right. cash reserve bhi kaho gaya the. So, but uh, one thing that really worked for us is both of us were super committed. Mm. We never looked for any other opportunities. There was mm. a lot of temptation. Right. Ki yaar, uh, and look, everyone was wondering ki ho kya raha hai. That I am US mein rahe aare hai, achhi business school bheja chuke hai. Mm. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 one of my uh, 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 family members uh, thought ki nobody was able to gather ki yari achha kaasa bank bank me kaam gai yaha pe kiyo aake kya kar raha hai to kisi ne bola ki kisi ko laga ki maa investment bank karta tha kisi ne bola ki somebody really truly a well wisher said ki yari bank of badaudha me kiya hai isko dekh lo ki to maa ne bada nahi abhi maa ne dekhu ga for time maa dekh lenge to basically the good thing is we never looked for any opportunities and we were committed to high trading and finding something right and look basically uh eight days all over and i was always excited about the next new thing right kabhi diwali mele mein jaake hum kuch wo laga rahe hain aur basically we got some on i lost the bigger picture in terms of what we came for but we were committed we kept eye trading and I distinctly remember almost सवा साल हो चुका था and पहले business school के जो friends से बोलते हैं अरे यार तू सही कर रहा है this is the dream come true entrepreneurship कर रहा है but very quickly you realise कि एक साल में लोग vacation पे घूम रहे हैं यहाँ पे और जो तुम्हारा dream come true है 
वो बेसिकली तुम्हारा प्रोफेशन है तो आपको उसमें सक्सीड होना ही है तो उसने किसी एक बहुत ही अच्छा दोस्त है उसने मुझे बता दिया यार कि आई वॉज अगेन एक्साइटेड कि यार मैं इस मैंने ये कर लूँगा तो सोच ले एक बार कि अब एक डेढ़ साल हो गया है एंड यू शुड रियली गेज प्रॉपरली कि कहीं जा रहा है कहीं जा रहा है तो फिर उसके बाद बेसिकली फॉर्चुनेटली मतलब वी कैप्ट आई ट्रेटिंग एंड वी जस्ट थॉट कि बेसिकली आर आर मॉडल वॉज टू कॉम्प्लेक्स वी आर ट्राइंग टू गो थ्रू डॉक्टर्स एंड ट्राइंग टू गो टू द कस्टमर वी आर लाइक लेट जस्ट सिम्प्लीफाई ई कॉमर्स वॉज बिगनिंग टू हैपन यू नो फ्लिपकार्ट वॉज टेकिंग ऑफ टू यूर लाइक लेट जस्ट टेक अ वर्टिकल कंडीशन वॉन्स नफ स्पेस दैट वी कैन फाइंड आर ओन ब्रांड तो हमने उसको सिम्प्लीफाई कर दिया था तो फिर वी जस्ट गॉट सम इनिशियल सीट कैपिटल और एक बार आपके पास सीट कैपिटल आ जाए तो आपकी ऑब्लिगेशन मिल जाती है उसको कैपिटल वापस कर दिए तो बेसिकली दैट कैपिटल गोइंग ऑन तो बेसिकली इट वॉज लाइक लिल बिट ऑफ अ जर्नी टू गेट टू so start the company. before you guys arrived at you know the eventual model of 1mg which is you know uh, selling uh, medicines online yeah from day 1 till how how many years did it take for you guys to arrive at that point so basically we came in uh, we started uh, we moved to india in november of 2009 so one and half years mm. to basically simplify the model right. and incorporate health card mm. as a online pharmacy model right and uh, uh, and then basically because of regulations we could not do right. this to begin mm-hmm. with so we thought we will build the brand and at mm-hmm. some point we will add the medicines right. to this so we added all the other categories uh, mm-hmm. that are typically chemist will run it so baby care product okay. so you know all the fmcg products right. and all that uh, including nutrition mm-hmm. and uh, we started selling online right. and uh, we thought we'll just come to medicine so so it's about 18 to 24 month journey of tinkering with a lot of things trying various things which is वेरी टिपिकल दस अदर थिंग आई थिंक यू नो लॉट ऑफ पीपल वेट फॉर सुपर क्लैरिटी कि एक बार जब आइडिया चमक जाएगा तब चालू करेंगे बट बहुत बड़ी फैलसी है मेरे हिसाब से लुक यू कैन यू हैव टू स्टार्ट एंड यू हैव टू लर्न बट यू टू पिक दैट एरिया विच इज विच यूर पैशनेट अबाउट अदरवाइज वो बिना इट्रेशन की जस्ट दिस नो मैजिकल मोमेंट की आई थिंक बन चमकी ऐसा नहीं होता आई थिंक बहुत काफ़ी इन्फॉर्मेशन इससे मिलती भी होता है ना इस वेन यू आर वर्किंग सॉन फुल टाइम then maybe in the evening we can you are reading something talking to some people calling with two three experts versus when you're doing full time then you know 24 by 7 you are thinking about it you know meeting lot of people spending time on the ground yeah so you cannot take a decision which require that information immersion yeah. with just you know doing armchair you know thinking yeah. about that so i think this is a little counter intuitive but i also agree i think once people have their runway and you know and general idea about the let's say in your case of the health and tech yeah then no we would have to jump in yeah and then figure things out while you're in that right and you've seen so many examples look look at any company and no company is looks like the original idea yeah and the i think the magic of the entrepreneur or the team is to basically navigate to like more yeah. sort of uh, viable parts of the business right. in that industry but typically you just learn yeah. i trade i think so little bit you know what are saying is a lot of people think it तभी स्टार्ट करते हैं विल सी इन ट्वेल्व टू एटीन मंथ्स कुछ वर्कआउट होएगा तो ठीक है नहीं तो विल गो बैक जॉब दैट्स ऑलमोस्ट गारंटीड टू फेल यू हैव टू ऑलमोस्ट स्टार्ट अभी स्टार्ट करते हैं इन ट्वेल्व टू एटीन मंथ विल फिगर आउट कि क्या करने वाले हैं एंड देन द जर्नी विल रिली स्टार्ट अभी एंड दैट इज इन अ गुड के सिनारियो इन मिनटर में तो चार साल लग गए थे यू नो वी आर डूइंग ऑल कैंड ऑफ रैंडम थिंग्स सेलिंग पर्सनलाइज पर्सनलाइज प्रोडक्ट्स ऑनलाइन बी टू बी गिफ्टिंग ऑफलाइन क्यूज करते करते चार साल बाद इज इट इट योर ऑफिस इन सीन द जर्नी या या आई थिंक यू आर सेइंग यू नो द होल ऑफिस आर लिटरेड विद दोस पर्सनलाइज योर इंडिया जर्सीज इन ऑल द आइडिया सो इट आई डोंट रियली थिंक बट चार साल लग गए टू फाइनली अराइव इन द कैटेगरी व्हिच फाइनली कुड टेक ऑफ आई थिंक दैट्स अदर एंड दैट दैट इज द बिग ट्रिक व्हाइल वी कैन से कि यू टेक अ रनवे ऑफ 2 इयर्स बट दैट वेरी वेरी हार्ड टू गेट आउट ऑफ द प्रॉब्लम बिकॉज़ देयर इज ऑलवेज दिस नेक्स्ट मंथ व्हेन यू आर ट्राई समथिंग but but the real iteration only happens once you commit to it right. otherwise there's no magical <laughs> so you know one mg so once you guys you know start selling i think so you're saying first you started with the other adjacent categories which didn't require licensing yeah. i'm guessing eventually you guys got the licenses was there a point at one mg when you know you know the phase is like slow phase at some point you saw the you know trajectory shift and things started to take off because eventually obviously you know one mg became I'm one of the largest online pharmacy in India. Yeah. So how did that you know first few years pan out? So basically, look, we started in 2011, and 11 to 14 uh, was basically constantly building this model. And I typically call e-commerce companies in those days and even today uh, SUVs. <laughs> okay. They require a lot of fuel. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and they have to keep running. <laughs> yes. So uh, so basically, look, the business model was still evolving, and it required a lot of fuel to sort of get mm. to the hump overall. So we kept raising capital. Uh, the model was sort of sharpening, 
but 2015 is where the big sort of restructuring of Pivot happened for us, where we spun out the pharmacy business into 1MG and Prashant mm-hmm. moved there to run that full Oh, so till that you were running as a health card as a brand? Yeah, yeah. Okay. so there was only health card mm-hmm. until 2014. And uh, late 2014 is where we basically restructured the company, right. where we uh, spun out the pharmacy business. Sure. So what had happened is basically there were two sort of exciting opportunities which were sort of going and required very, very different capital allocation. Yeah. So we had launched an app, it mm-hmm. used to be called HealthCard Plus. Yeah. And uh, this was to drive engagement with customers. Right. And we had created transparency in terms yeah. of drug pricing and all that. That became viral by itself. Right. And we got inspired that maybe you can take a fresh look at the mm-hmm. pharmacy problem using right. mobile as a centerpiece of the business model. Uh, and But it required significant capital to go over the, uh, get over the business model and that became 1MG. Right. And at that point, 70% of our business was nutrition. So we had, frankly speaking, gotten accidental product market fit on nutrition because younger populations was coming online. And uh, in sports nutrition, there was a lot of counterfeiting uh, and there was no uh, no retail opportunity for people to go and buy these authentic products. So uh, somehow people started to relate to health card to basically buy these products. Um, uh, and we used to import a lot of these products from right. the US. So 70% of our business was nutrition. But at that point, we were facing more intense competition from Amazon. Hmm. And we had launched a private label in the form of uh, muscle base. Right. And we could see that we can make a nice profitable business yes. here. Uh, so that's why basically we restructured the company. And 1MG, Prashant moved to 1MG, ran that full time, uh, along with Gaurav. And uh, I continued to focus on him. Understood. And during that phase, 2010 to 15, let's a little talk a little more detail about one is just, just founder dynamics. Because, you know, I think founder dynamics in any early stage company is not easy. I think, yeah. you know, I've gone through my own, you know, challenges around that. Because ultimately, even two or three really well-meaning, highly competent people, they're independent, opinionated people, and so <laughs> on. So how is it like, you know, did it take effort, you know, what was your method of navigating, you know, those? Yeah. So, look, I have thought about this topic a lot. And I have seen the journey with Prashant as two co-founders and now as a single founder for the last seven, eight years. And uh, I think there's no magical formula, to be honest. Uh, So what happens when you're a single founder, your speed of execution clearly increases Mm. because then obviously you just uh, do what you're convinced about. As two co-founders, your speed would be slower, but your decisions would be a lot more well thought out. Mm. Uh, I certainly feel that more than two founders is can no, become a challenge. No. So I think two is the right optimal yeah. number. Now, in terms of uh, uh, two co-founders, as far as there's an appreciation for the strengths of each co-founder, mm-hmm. uh, then basically things work out well. So frankly speaking, uh, you know, uh, and Prashant is one of the very close friends now for so many years. And I really believe that uh, him and me are very two different approaches to business. And we bring two different things to the table. As far as you can appreciate that and you can work together, then you can basically, uh, uh, you know, work like that. But there's no, you know, co-founder, everyone will say that. It's like a marriage, right? Uh, and until this, you get into the marriage, you will not know how, how, how the other person works. But frankly speaking, it's about uh, uh, having an egoless relationship uh, look, because, uh, you know, who does what and who does not do uh, what can become an uh, ego tussle, number one. Uh, so, A, egoless, and because we have, they have to realize that ultimately they are going towards the same goal. And second, realizing what the other person is naturally good at and appreciating that and kind of, uh, that is the magic. Right. Uh, other, other, other part is also, it takes a lot of effort. I think, you know, when people are selecting their co-founders, it needs to be a very thoughtful, deliberate decision. It cannot be, you know, impromptu thing, right? Because if you, then you'll discover a lot of things about other person you may not know, your know, chemistry issues, uh, your problem solving approach, you know, your very analytical or very intuition driven and so on, bunch of things. And second thing, even with that, it will take a lot of effort, you know, for somebody to become a good co-founding team. It's not going to happen easily, you know, without a lot of... Well, absolutely. Look, basically, look, for example, we may be great friends, right? Because look, friendship, you're not working together. Exactly. 
that doesn't mean that you are right. great co-workers also yeah, correct correct so uh, it's an iterative process uh, you know frankly speaking i feel that uh, if you go back to college days mm. your closest friends are your you know iit wing mates right. and all that i think that is where people have no ego issues right uh, that is the great time to sort of start something right. together yeah. <laughs> but after that basically uh, I, i to be honest i don't know what is the right co-founder selection mm. process it is just that i think until this you are able to appreciate yeah. what the other person brings to the table uh, i don't think the relationship will say when it works it brings a lot of force multiplication like yeah. people are able to challenge each other bring some redundancy also your fall back plan you know as a single co-founder there is too much ownership on you so i think that all those are great things but then if there's friction starts to come in yeah. and you try you know you start to slow each other down so yeah. that's I think it's an important consideration that people need to just pay a lot of attention to. It's Absolutely. just not going to work, you Absolutely. know, on its own. And definitely, uh, co-founders are primarily co-worker relationship and not a friends relationship. Mm-hmm. So I think as, and finding potential co-founders or people you already work with is probably a better chance of because you know like how does this person perform in a work situation, right. stressful situation, and so on, right? So versus co-founding with a friend can you know backfire yeah. very easily because you you'll be surprised over you know no idea how this person. Absolutely. So basically, even look, I've seen both sides. If given a choice again, I would certainly like to work with a co-founder, right? right? Uh, because I think uh, uh, you know everyone talks about it, but I I think about entrepreneurship as a three-level triangle. Mm. Uh, you have your family, uh, you have your team, yeah, and then you have your investors, right? And I really believe that this has to <laughs> go into a virtuous cycle, yeah. Uh, it cannot spiral into a you know in the wrong way right and that is why to keep this in the virtuous cycle mm. uh, you will obviously go through you know significant ups and downs right. and co-founder is the only person that you can share that right. uh, with right. so basically otherwise it takes too much of load right. on you so yeah. during those five years were there any particularly low moments where you felt like what am i doing or you oh, were, absolutely this, so anything that you still remember uh so uh, there are small and big moments oh, wow. <laughs> so uh, uh, so basically look the thing is in e-commerce you had to raise capital yeah. right otherwise you can't you had to shut shop right? right so basically there was a few times where we just ran out of cash mm. and uh, how I, how much out like the money to pay next month payroll or no so i'll tell you uh, uh, i typically don't get stressed generally right but there was this time <laughs> where i had to literally uh, we were going to run out of cash literally in i would say 15 days to a month hmm. and we were talking to a lot of investors there was always a hope because right. as an entrepreneur yeah. optimist and uh, and somehow at the last moment uh, uh, the investor commitment did not come through hmm. so we were literally you know you were like running towards a hill and it's going to <laughs> you know fall uh and i and and cash uh, cash was super crunched mm-hmm. because we also used to sell so there was a uh working capital Correct. issue and all that yeah. so literally this is uh, almost like that christmas new year time and i had to spend every day in the morning planning for how much discount i will run on each product mm. which will drive how much cash mm. and how do i stretch every single day mm. and i had to do it in a closed group because you can't also give this was this 2013 uh, 14 14 okay <laughs> yeah so but i remember like this was like the container was coming and i had to plan the yeah. commitment and i literally had to plan every single day how much money i have to squeeze and how did you guys come out of it magically everything works this so, <laughs> for me right. we raised the money but okay. uh, there was no uh, so there, there were things like that so everyone i'm sure right. like you have gone through it and uh, that is where basically uh, i think co-founder definitely helps in those moments right. uh, and, uh, and basically uh, there were several other moments where the, the reason i say 2013 2013 was particularly bad year in india like you just all have day stop no one investing so we had an mentor with a similar near that experience you know literally cash run we have less than 10 days and all of that and so, yeah, it was <laughs> that's a very harrowing <laughs> experience yeah literally so that's why look basically i am generally more uh, conservative about cash mm-hmm. so so people don't understand it now uh, uh, you know investors are looking at it do you have enough cash or that but i am very very particular about cash because look uh, cash is oxygen for you 
and uh, in our kind of a company because look generally now the business is a lot more stable and uh, profitable and all this but basically i'm very very particular about definitely not running out of cash so 2015 uh, you guys decide to basically split uh, organization into two one mg to pursue online uh, pharmacy and you were going to focus on health card to build at that time the uh, it was to build supplements business or what is a different thesis yeah, yeah. so basically uh, uh, the whole idea was we realized that uh, there was heavy competition coming right. from horizontals and as a vertical mar- vertical marketplace yeah. uh, uh, we just did not stand any chance right so the idea was to build consume reorient the company mm. rather than focusing on e-commerce yeah. or distribution business mm. kind of build consumer brands yeah. and we had a private label in the form of muscle base mm. so the idea was we wanted to create uh, 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 consumer brands business in nutrition sure. starting with muscle base but i know you got it got it and how did you like you guys at that time uh, raise capital separately for both entity yeah. like how did the structuring of one mg and healthcare separate company happen? so basically uh, we had raised a round of capital and we basically split it okay. uh, uh, you know uh so demerge kind of uh, demerge and uh, demerge and uh, some capital went to one ng and basically some capital stayed at right. cart and basically the, these became two independent companies mm. uh, after that and it was just like uh, you know just going so this feel pretty good in retrospect i mean both companies have done extremely well we would have vanished if we would have not uh, taken that decision in hindsight absolutely and that inside of taking a decision you yeah. know how did that happen you know was it clear at the time that this is the right thing to do so uh, in hindsight i can tell you now that if the capital uh, requirement of even within the same company is very different for different types mm. of uh, businesses or business lines it is very hard to kind of put them all together so it was a right decision to take the way it happened was uh, not planned mm. uh, because you know we were raising capital and we were getting very different signals for the investors some investors were interested in this business some investors were excited about this other business right. so it kind of uh, uh, became uh, uh, you know apparent that we had to do this uh, 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 but basically in hindsight my learning is basically as a company you have to have some uh, uniformity in terms of mm. how you think about capital right. allocation because what will happen is like one department which is generating cash right. the other department which is like looking for a long right. term there will always be this tussle right. between <laughs> and so after you guys demerge and then i think you know 2014 15 is when kind of e-commerce hit its you know sweet spot it just starts to take off in a big way yeah. and one mg also benefited you know medicine turned out to be a, this you know way it's a very large category tam is massive compared yeah. to nutrition you know, where tam is very very small yeah. and as a result you know 1mg eventually you know uh, achieved significant scale eventually got acquired by tarda etc how was it to watch it you know i'll come to health card but watch you know mg 1mg grow so rapidly and just watching it from sidelines and obviously you are shareholder you feel good from that point of view but also having to watch it from distance now so basically look i realize that uh, and this is just generally my personality i i typically don't seek any validation nor do i want to do certain things where i am not comfortable with so uh, you know one mg i think only prashant could have run i i would not have been able to run one mg because it went through significant ups and downs the whole market was very chaotic like regulations were still getting uh, kind of formed and all that so basically the re- resilience and ambiguity handling that uh, was required i think prashant is great fit for that no no absolutely so, is outstanding you know i also got an opportunity to work closely with him you know during my tired is sustained so i can see you know he is he can manage all kind of stakeholders and able to come here right, right, and right. deal with you know so and that is his natural sort of strength right. and i uh, sometimes think that while we have operated in vc space yes. i am i have much more like profitability in this private equity mindset right. so i was uh, happy doing yeah. what i was doing right. and i was very happy that i also a shareholder in some company right. so, basically yeah. hit a six yeah. so so uh, so and then basically look uh, always used to exchange notes and but i i think the crazy ride that uh, <laughs> yeah, i was uh, an interesting so, anecdote i'm pretty sure so you know it i said so during my tara district days i actually got to be on one mg board for a period of time yeah. i was like quite crazy the company that you started you know and eventually you were not actively involved in operating capacity and you know 
I was able to kind of see, you know, at least understand a little bit about the company, you know, from uh, front lines. You know, it was. Did so I'm really proud of what they, these guys had built, and um, uh, and I think really the market took off and all that. So basically, it's a very very strong consumer brand. Right. It will like really. Proud of yeah, now I'm just doing well. I think you know, especially last one year, I think things have even gotten better for them. I think you know, scale is there. There is you know, steady path to profitability is there, yeah. and. Really, no strong competition. I think. Uh, I think yeah, the, the, and also it's you no know, pretty good hand with with uh, Tata. So they can think very long term now. Yeah, yeah, I think things are going going really well. So now coming to health card, right? So I think from again from distance, what I can recall, Samir is from 2015 to 2020. You kind of build the business very patiently. Yeah. You know, it's as I think you almost kind of you know you and health card. Little bit disappeared, you know, from the public view. Not very little conversation about health card, but steadily, you you know, um, decide to build muscle base. You said private label, but eventually muscle base actually build, you know, became a brand. And maybe we'll later we'll talk about difference between you know brand and private yeah. label, right? But uh, what was like? Were you clear at that time that you know you want to try to build a like really genuine, authentic product that the fitness goers will like and become their preferred choice? Right, right. So basically, as I mentioned, uh, we in health card we were very clear that because we can't survive as a retailer, mm. we had to build consumer brands. Yeah. And by you know uh, this whole topic of brand versus private label is very very close to my heart. And to be honest, I am a very different person uh, from compared to eleven to fifteen versus what I have learned from yeah. uh, from this second right. phase of yeah. health card journey. Right. So I deeply think about brands and differentiation mm. all that. So basically, the whole idea was like we had to make a profitable business, and profitability will come from building consumer brands. Yeah, and consumer brands will require a very different way of thinking. Mm. It's not about like you know uh, distributing the brands. It's about fundamentally solving a problem for a customer. Yeah, it's the product that people will have to like. Mm. It's not about the distribution journey right. anymore. So uh, that is the journey we uh, took uh, uh, took in two thousand fifteen. And first challenge was to reorient the organization, mm-hmm. right? Because you know uh, you're living in this whole tech world, yeah. and everyone's like doing cool tech stuff. Mm-hmm. But then basically, we had to develop this whole product thinking capabilities. Yeah. So there was a sports nutrition, there was a vitamin, and then there was a weight loss. Mm-hmm. So we were like, uh, let's just kind of build two, three brands here, and then uh, they will have a faster adoption online. We will try to sell them online using health card platform right. and eventually to grow. Yeah. So we started with these three spaces. Uh, muscle base uh, became the front runner where we had a lot of learnings in terms of sort of building the community, building mm-hmm. a differentiated product, and all that. And then other brand spaces have gone through a lot of iteration, but eventually they have arrived. Got cool. it. So since you said in this topic of you know brands versus labels is very close to your heart, yeah. I mean you know in our you know Mintra journey we also tried to build a bunch of in-house labels. I don't know some are maybe brands, some are labels. You know, but um, what is you know how will you describe you know what is the fundamental difference between brand and label? So now I feel everything is a brand. Right. So Bukesh, you are a brand. Hmm. I am a brand. Uh, maybe Abhishek is a brand. So fundamentally, what is What are the two, three things that primarily you stand for, yeah. right? That defines the brand. Mm. And when I say brand, you consistently deliver on what your promise is. Right. So look, maybe when people think about Mukesh, they will think at a strong entrepreneur, problem solver. Uh, maybe somebody will be like a diligent worker. Mm. So basically, you build these brand choices mm. so whether you like it or not like it mm. your brand will be formed right question is you have to take control mm. of what is the direction that you want to mm. shape it so slightly philosophical there sure. but ultimately uh, from a consumer branch perspective i believe that people don't think about differentiation enough mm. so i think about this as a three level funnel mm. so there are a lot of needs that keep arising in yeah. the market then there would be solutions which have to cater to these needs in the solution Certain businesses will say, "I will over-index on this solution," yeah. or "I will cater to this consumer segment," and some other businesses will take a different approach. Yeah. And what you decide to do and what you decide not to do mm. is ultimately the brand choices that you make. Right. So even for example, while people don't think about, let's say, Flipkart mm. or Amazon, Amazon as two different brands, mm. 
but fundamentally there's a differentiation yeah there's certain people who will get over indexed maybe right. certain category of users or certain people yeah and those are the subtleties that you have to think right. about mm. and i'm going to be very honest from 11 to 15 i had no idea mm. every revenue was similar to me mm. and it was just like yeah as the pnl <laughs> and you're not thinking about these things mm. so what once you get into this consumer business i actually deeply care about differentiation mm. and then deciding that this is what we will stand for mm. and put all our energies right. on what you stand for yeah. and let go of things that you can't win mm. uh and that to me is sort of the brand building journey so i think you need to be super clear about what you stand for very consistent in every single you know stance and that needs to be differentiated and i'm guess what i want to say if it is not differentiated then it's a label it may still stand for something it's still consistent but sure. because it's not differentiated it's a label no because label the fundamental thesis is because you had some other structural advantage yeah. distribution you're making that product available but you're not actually going into the consumer need to be able right. to do any differentiation right. so you don't need differentiation because your channel of distribution itself is a differentiation so, so you have some other related advantage which is has no direct benefit like for example mintra you know yeah. as a huge amount of traffic so that's yeah. the advantage right so whatever you put there is going to sell and now if that you know now you can choose to build something which is highly differentiated which is a slow long patient game yeah. or you can just put something put a literally a label on it yeah you know source it cheaply and you don't really need to spend any money on marketing etc right. so your margin still could be pretty healthy that's right that's right So to me I think this uh, uh going deeper into consumer insights yeah. because look ultimately when you build these physical products right. or any brand you you don't have a consultative selling yeah. model you can't communicate Correct. the yeah. difference so basically the product mm. has to deliver yeah what you have been generally been communicating right. and over time let's say you keep doing it year on year right. that compounding of trust goes in and basically brand becomes a strong pull yeah. brand it just eases out the decision making of a consumer so and in, yeah in your mind how long was the journey of you know where you think muscle blaze went from maybe you know a private label of health card to a brand in its own right so i think i would break it down into two three phases so basically look it was a private label to begin with in 2015 we started to invest in r&d but mm-hmm. uh, r&d came slightly later but basically go deeper into what products are we mm-hmm. selling right and what is it where how do we source the quality yeah. uh, uh, of protein mm-hmm. and this and that and then what is it that people are looking for how are we solving that so that phase itself took 1 to 2 years yeah uh, that was a first phase of transition mm-hmm. that basically look muscle base is now providing good genuinely yeah. good products and all that and second basically we uh second phase was the communication or marketing mm-hmm. phase in terms of communicating to customers that this is what we stand for right so that is where i think when we did the first campaign and it's a pretty amazing campaign and i keep looking back at this campaign when i need to pump up yeah. <laughs> so there's a tum nahi samjhoge campaign that mm-hmm. we did and it did wonders for uh, uh, for the brand where people uh, you know be- people did not uh, so there was no indian brand which was mm-hmm. basically motivating people right. to sort of work out and we came with this insight that mm-hmm. this whole uh, fitness journey is quite lonely mm-hmm. and underappreciated right and we did this campaign to capture that emotion mm-hmm. and then muscle base got tied to that yeah. so that became sort of the second phase of mm-hmm. brand building and finally uh, the third phase came in where we actually went very deep into r&d mm-hmm. and uh, uh, we have a patented technology which actually solves for absorption problem of right. protein and that became like a large part of muscle base so mm-hmm. i think it has gone through three right. phases one yeah. basic product development second communication and third going deeper into the got it so like you know doing all these fundamentals over probably 4 or 5 year period so when you started in muscle blaze as a private label at that time i think the high quality whey protein in india was all imported and there a lot of this you know counterfeits or less quality control and today fast forward you know 7 8 years muscle blaze is the is by far the largest uh, whey protein brand in india it's, it's, it is made in india although made in india is so cool now but you know this is uh made in india people have been you know millions of people consume it's available everywhere then distribution across online offline it reaches you know far and wide it's really trusted brand yeah so must feel pretty good right to be able to create this brand really from scratch and which also 
which is just not a label uh, but really truly stand for something as a clear differentiation no no absolutely i you know definitely proud uh, really proud of what we have done and i think this whole uh, uh, you know if you look at this industry a lot of the products which were used were coming from uh, you know imports mm. so for us to be able to create our own product where we have a patented technology where people our product is better rated than some of these foreign uh, foreign mm. uh, imported products really makes us proud of it and uh, it's a true sort of uh, you know really proud of basically we've created differentiation gone deep right and we are excited uh, that we are also want to introduce this product range uh, to outside india and we want to take this to internationally excellent and what do you think is today is there enough you know how, where are we in terms of just um, penetration of uh, or awareness of uh, whey protein as a like significant macro supplement you know most readily available supplement in like, where are we on that awareness journey in india so i think look mukesh you are in this business so you would know the whole journey starts from people working out yeah. right and uh, of that funnel there are certain people who are seriously sort of working out and there are certain people who are casually working out right. and people will adopt uh, these uh, uh, additional supplements to sub, uh, to support their journey at different stages so i think whey protein awareness is increasing and also like if i look back so i think two things that have seen change in last 10 years so earlier on there was a huge misconception of this something funky about mm. this product so i am not this product only for product. bodybuilders you know? yeah bodybuilders and uh, because look i think uh, a little bit of uh, uh, imagery about people using banned substances mm. as kind of uh, yeah. you know people extrapolate that this is yeah. not for me mm. uh, that has changed uh, number one so clearly acceptance of protein in general is there and second i think also uh, what we are also seeing is like especially uh, especially women consumers gradually adopting these supplements mm-hmm. because earlier it was like yaar mujhe to muscle nahi banayenge right but basically when you see people want to be fit and all this so this is becoming like very very right. mainstream so i think in terms of penetration levels i think there's a reasonable right. amount about of awareness uh and the whole hitch of this is right or wrong yeah. is going away but still having said that like counterfeiting still exists in right. india and uh, uh there are people who kind of take advantage of the fact that this is an expensive product so basically but gradually people are getting but in overall i mean you guys are in an outstanding position you have nearly 30% market share of this category category itself is going you know growing 20% annually i think we are still at a very low level of you know penetration when it comes to supplement or gyms for that matter for that. but you know next 10 20 years it'll just keep growing there is just yeah. no other place to go but to keep growing up and as a you know somebody who's already category leader massive growth runway ahead of you absolutely so basically look sports nutrition market is uh, roughly 6 7 billion in the us yeah. that number is like 400 million in india mm. right and this number was like not even 100 million like right. maybe 5 7 years ago in india if you take a 10 year view yeah. you just can't go wrong right, right? Uh, uh the only thing that you have to care about is have you got into a scale yeah. where you can basically sustain yourself right. profitably and after that basically maybe there are certain years where you will see massive growth certain years uh slightly lower growth mm-hmm. but ultimately if you keep working at it you will keep compounding so i have no doubt that uh, this industry is going to explode and same thing for the gyms no same yeah you know, we are very excited i think uh, the fitness culture is obviously growing a lot of people are becoming aware that how critical fitness is for overall well being you know the biggest but how many gym members are there in india so Few total the numbers that i am aware of there are about uh, 5 million paid gym uh, members on an annual basis okay. people who will pay for gym another 5 million will work out in their apartment gyms or corporate gym and additional 10 12 million people who are active active mean you know, they will go for a jog run okay. cycling etc some kind of so about 20 million people total okay. you know out of a country of uh, you know 1.4 billion <laughs> so even with these number it puts the overall you know activity levels at about um, you know less than 2% okay while in west you know, this number will be more than 20% more than 20 so i think but that's a great news you know there is a 10 year um, 10x headroom for growth available and it's absolutely inevitable and i think things are only accelerating i think so it should definitely benefit you know definitely cult and health cult but anybody else also yeah. who is in the fitness industry no absolutely i think um, we feel very very fortunate that uh, work in an industry which is taking off yeah. and uh, maybe it's very hard to say that did you start early or later but you are at a point where you can basically 
have the full foundation, full R and D engine to be able to produce like good products and all that. And it's just going to come from. No, amazing. I think I have no doubt. Muscle Blaze will be definitely a household name. Go to you know, go to brand for. Uh, whey protein requirements in India, but eventually I'm sure you will figure out a way to also sell it internationally. So Samir, while we are talking about this whole brand building journey, yesterday I think you were sharing with me, you know, your whole approach and thought process about really getting to know your customer. In fact, you asked a very simple question, which is actually very complicated. Can you describe precisely, you know, who is your customer? Yeah. Just can you talk more about your process? Like how do you approach that? How do you develop that, you know, very, very accurate, precise understanding of customers? So. In no way, any uh, we claim that we have uh, that kind of understanding, but we we make an effort towards that. So look, basically, uh, as I was sharing uh, yesterday, uh, you go through this journey of kind of figuring out, uh, you know, uh, you have to sell a product, mm. and the product is going to be selling unassisted with some marketing communication. Mm. But you have like this. 30 seconds or 60 seconds to talk about why you're different, right? Mm -hmm. So you you really have to kind of really understand whom you are targeting and what is the problem that you're solving. So uh, so basically the point that we were discussing yesterday, uh, we care a lot about like basically who is your customer. Mm. And uh, there are a lot of biases that get built. So for example, you know, uh, you go to cult or maybe I go to this fancy gym and then you think that the whole India story is about these people yeah. because obviously you are able to relate to your lifestyle and all that. But the reality is, uh, you know, people who are consuming because India is such a diverse and large country, the segments could be very different. And what happens is unless you are able to bring the core stakeholders in the company together and have a common understanding of who this customer is and real good appreciation of, you know, how does that customer look yeah. like? Uh, you may be building something for something different, mm. while it may be accidentally be used by other people, but then your decision-making framework would be different. So, uh, I'll just re-narrate the story that I was talking mm. yesterday. So, uh, you know, we did this exercise, look, basically one year we devoted full year just to increase the NPS scores for muscle base. So, we had transitioned from a private label uh, and then we were trying to go deep into the brand. And before you even progress, you're saying when you say one full year devoted to improving NPS, that was the most important metric. You said like sales is less important, profit is less important, yeah. NPS really matters. Yeah, yeah. That itself, I mean, I think, I don't know, 0.01% of the companies in India will actually, you know, especially in the digital world, will prioritize NPS, which is a proxy for customer experiencing. Sure. This is what matters us to the most. I think that itself is a great starting point. So to be honest, Consumer companies, uh, uh, I think, in my view, you can't change the demand significantly yeah. for how the market is evolving until this you are in the category creation game, which yeah. is expensive. So uh, 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 what you can control is basically the product experience. And at some point, you have to do that exercise. So we had this one year where basically... So I want to interrupt you again. Before progress story, can you also explain NPS? Because you know we oh. use it in our everyday parlance, but you know what is NPS? Very simple. How many customers of yours who use your product will basically actively promote your product without yeah. any assistance? Mm -hmm. That's the simple definition. There's a mathematical formula, but ultimately... What's the formula? Eh? Formula is like there's a promoter, there's a detractor. You subtract the promoter from detractor and you come up with this NPS score. Right. But ultimately, it is how many people will just say good things about your product overall. So, uh, uh, just to give you an example, the gold standard would be like Apple kind of companies will have a NPS score of like 70 or so. Most of the e-commerce companies in India will operate between 50 and 60, right. I guess, right? Yeah. Overall. Right. But basically, uh, uh, so we, we were struggling with this fact that we were getting this feedback about some people will say that your product is really cool. It tastes really well. And again, similar number of some people will say that your product is not good. So we were struggling with this fact that what do we do? Like what, what is happening? And uh, uh, we, we basically, to solve this problem, we got together a cross-functional team where we had our R&D head, our brand team, myself, and maybe uh, some core people in the team. And we said, like, let's have a deeper understanding of why this is happening, mm -hmm. right? Why is the same product being rated very, very differently by, you know, mm -hmm. same group of people? So we didn't, uh, as a good thing is in D2C world, you have access to so much of data, so many consumers you can just talk to. And and this is such an old category. Yeah. People are happy to give feedback. Mm. They're happy to do video calls. They're happy right. to invite you. 
to uh, because you know the fitness journey is quite uh, you know involved and people yeah. are really deeply interested in that journey while they are going through this journey. So we used to do these video calls. And what we realized is, look, our perception was like this: uh, uh, this guy is going to the gym and like taking the shaker and kind of, sha- you know, <laughs> taking this. Uh, but basically, we realized some people were actually consuming whey protein in this cup, hmm. and he was putting a little bit of water in the cup. He was putting a little bit of water in the cup. He was putting a little bit of <laughs> so, so, so this was basically video call. Haan. And then we decided t- we took appointment with haan. some people and we were like, Ki yaar, chalo, ghar ja ke Ye customer dikta kaise hai. Fir, uh, we used to basically subay, subay, Saturday morning ko, gaadi pe the, aur fir, hum appointment lete the, jase char, appointment a ke, and we will just basically go. Yeah. So we were very, very humbled with the fact that people are actually letting us, hmm. you know, uh, in their homes. Uh, so but then we realized this ek hum bande ghar gaye to wo kya hai bilkul hi jaise hota na paying guest ye kahi pe wo reh raha tha aur andar jaane ke liye gaadi bahar park karni padi to chal ke andar andar gali mein jana pada phir upar chal ke tum ek udhar gaye to wo bola yaar ye kaun customer hai phir usne khola phir humne bola uska room literally aap samajh lo ki 100 150 square feet ka room hai usi mein ek cupboard hai हमने बोला यार हमें देखना है कि आप कैसे शेक बना के पीते हो तो उसने कबर्ड खोली अंदर से एक वो शेकर निकाला और वहां पे पाउडर डाला बोलते हैं यार तो तो बेसिकली व्हाट आई वाज ट्राइंग टू से इज कि आर विजुअल वाज कि ये लोग ऐसे जिम में जाते हैं ये जाते हैं बट द रियलिटी वाज देयर वाज अ लॉट ऑफ स्टूडेंट्स हु वर लिविंग इन सम अदर टाउन्स एंड वेरी लिमिटेड मींस एंड दे वर यूजिंग आवर प्रोडक्ट्स हैप्पीली and uh, it just completely changed the perception so that's why basically we uh, you know there were a lot of learnings which came about for example very simple insight uh, amount of water that you put in your shake will completely change your perception of taste of a shake and we as a brand were not communicating how much exact water that you need to put in to get the right taste so very very simple uh, this one but more importantly what came about was like basically we do a very simple exercise where we just say ki yaar aapka brand hai theek hai to agar tum kisi se simple puchoge who is your customer to people will say mera ye bhi customer hai ye bhi customer hai ye bhi customer aise kar kar ke basically log sari ginti kara lenge correct but the real question is about prioritization aapke 30 40% segment kaun sa hai uske agla 20 kaun sa hai so if you force prioritize and ask people to draw a simple picture ki yaar ye aisa dikhta hai correct that itself is eye opening so mm. uh, to basically uh, coming back to this ye ultimately realization of who your customer is uh, and whom are you trying to solve this problem for mm. goes a long way in terms of what approach that you take right. to the brand no no i think this is a simple but very very powerful framework i think anyone who is selling to consumers directly can do this exercise, can pause this podcast right now and say who is your number one consumer segment which is very precisely defined. So you can exactly define it. This person has this age, gender, profession. This is where the person lives. This is what the person wears. Yeah. This is his or her income level is. These are her uh, you know, challenges in life, yeah. motivations, like very, very accurate pictures. So you can actually visualize the person in the room. With that, the choices you will make about product features, communication will be very different versus generic, you know, my customers are 28 to 30. Yeah, you have a customer, right? Correct. Right? And look, now it's a very big challenge. Kya hota hai? Look, ultimately, look, when you talk about consumer brands or any business, it's about getting the right pricing. Yeah. It's about getting the right differentiation. So, if you have a customer who defined the customer, and you have a customer who defined India, mein bhi, तुम दो डिफरेंट इंडिया में क्या आता है एक प्राइस पॉइंट के बाद ऐसा <laughs> नीचे मतलब आपने अगर प्राइस एक लेवल पर बढ़ा दी तो एकदम से स्टीप ड्रॉप हो जाता है आपके वॉल्यूम्स का एंड वी समटाइम्स डोंट डिफाइन द कस्टमर इनफ टू बी एबल टू से कि यार मैं गुड़गांव के गोल्फ कोर्स पे रहने वालों के लिए ब्रांड बना रहा हूं या फिर मैं इंडिया के इमर्जिंग मिडिल क्लास के लिए जो बेसिकली आज Hmm. Uh, yahan pe ka ho. Ye simple question bhi kai baar, we are not clear and that is why we don't take the right pricing decisions and right because fundamentally we are not clear about who your primary customer is. Well, that too, let's say a cult customer and you know we may have some very 
affluent customers which will say complain ki are valet parking kyun nahi hai hame matlab and you know come in a nice car etc and some will notice ki maine customer se baat kari aur customer bol raha hai ki valet parking hai to banate hain versus you know that may be 1% percent of customer base sure, sure. like 40% of customer base you know have very different problem so i think having that clarity otherwise you, know, you end up building randomly wrong features even if you look at plastic fmcg companies they have different brands to address different yeah. price points or different uh, needs yes, and exactly. all that तो वो अल्टीमेटली वही से स्टेम होता है बट क्वेश्चन इज कि वेन यू आर ट्राइंग टू बिल्ड एन यू गेट बायस बाई योर ओन व्यूज एंड यू नो आई थिंक इट इज इम्पॉर्टेंट टू की जस्ट ग्रास्प ऑन नंबर्स आई थिंक यू नो फॉर वॉट इज शेयरिंग विद मी लाइक यू रियली हैव अ प्रिटी गुड बोथ मैक्रो एंड माइक्रो अंडरस्टैंडिंग और द नंबर्स अक्रॉस एंड विच अलाउज यू टू सी पैटर्न एंड हाउ थिंग्स चेंज ओवर ए पीरियड ऑफ टाइम Just talk a bit more about that. You know, how does that shape you in influencing things within the organization? So basically, look, uh, I I've just realized that if I look at my own strengths, look, so numbers is definitely mm. well, one of my strengths. So for me, it's that if I have seen one or two or three or four times before, I've seen a number. So because I'm constantly building this thesis, right? Because as an entrepreneur, you're always right. trying to figure out that this model will work, this will not work, this model will be a problem. Man. So you're able to kind of always, uh, and data plays a big role in terms of supporting that thesis yeah. and arriving at a particular uh, hypothesis. So my thing is that that two months before, I remember the number. So if someone tells me that this was the day, then I say, "Yeah, you told me that day." So, uh, so overall, data-oriented culture. But just a word on caution on that. I just felt, and this has come after 25 years of maturity. Uh, we were all super analytical coming from iits and all that and we just feel that this number thing is like the thing but i really believe that uh, sometimes it can also impair your decision making because uh uh kai bar you get so deep into the numbers that you lose the bigger picture and it becomes almost like a tool for you to procrastinate and not take the hard decisions so uh as far as there's a right balance it is great it allows you to anchor everyone on the facts but it should not create an impediment in terms of you taking the decisions which are not going to be solved in data ha so there is a no but ha there is obviously a danger of analysis paralysis i think the framework i use is is first you have to absorb all the data agar kuch data exist karta hai usko nahi dekh rahe ho to that is inexcusable yeah. like you should know then you are you know deliberately you know flying but, blind but you are absolutely right because dekho uh, even when people even structuring of data right itself uh when you're trying to reach certain metrics profitability yeah. customer scores and all these things i think 90% of time at least once the organization becomes slightly bigger aligning people and structuring the data itself is a huge value add that's right correct <laughs> so everyone should be oriented and first of all like agar data mil sakta to dekh lo like you know but at some point data will also stop yes. there are points where you have to make a intuitive call and that's where i think is a you know biggest leadership skill like i use this phrase that leadership starts when data stops oh. and data sabko pata hi hai to anyone can take a decision aur data dekh lo jo data bata raha hai wo kar lo usme matlab kya rocket science hai right at some point you know you don't know the answer that's where making a informed bet and then aligning all your resources to make that bet work is almost like a lot of times you know you don't take the right decision you take a decision make the decision right, right. through you know driving execution right and a lot of uh, but i think both part of the equation are uh, very well uh, quite valid you are also talking about you know your approach to like you know your way of looking you know in startup world people talk a lot about product market fit kya ek saal mein product market fit ho jayega uh what is your approach to that you know what how do you define like what is a really high quality product market fit yaar uh mera view to is mein nobody can define when the product market fit happens my definition in the brand world is very simple if it gets to a scale where it can generate a positive contribution margin for mm-hmm. me and not decline month on month right that to me is a classic definition right. of proof mm-hmm. is in the pudding ki wo product market fit ho gaya to agar for example and it could be a micro category mm-hmm. could be this one a macro or whatever but ultimately if you have collected enough number of consumers right. who value your value offering enough to be right. able to basically pay you premium, right. which covers your whatever cost to yeah. of serving them then you have achieved a product right. market fit I use certain proxies. Uh, so, for example, in uh, brands, I don't actually look at revenue too much. Mm. I look at uh, the quantities sold mm. because the ASPs could sure. be misleading. Right. So, uh, obviously, you have to put things in context in terms of how many users uh, potentially are there in the market. 
तो मुझे लगता है कि ब्रांड वर्ल्ड में अगर तुम आज की मेरी डेफिनेशन ये है कि लेट्स से 20 से 50,000 यूनिट्स पर मंथ बेचते लगते हो राइट तो फिर रीजनेबल क्रिटिकल मास आ गया उस कॉन्टेक्स में राइट तो वो मैंने कुछ प्रॉक्सीज बना रखे बीस हजार पचास हजार एक लाख तो उसके बेसिस पे दैट इज आई फील की एंड बट बट दी क्वेश्चन इज इट क्वालिटी ऑफ रेवेन्यू इज सुपर इम्पोर्टेंट राइट तो यू शुड नॉट बी गिविंग टू मच ऑफ डिस्काउंट दैट्स वाई द होल इकोनॉमिक्स हैव टू वर्क एंड देन बेसिकली दैट इज माइन राइट अदरवाइज दैट्स अ मोर ऑब्जेक्टिव डेफिनेशन बट देन अगर सॉफ्टवेयर डेफिनेशन में देखूंगा तो हाउ मेनी पीपल आर वाउचिंग फॉर योर प्रोडक्ट वॉट इज योर एन पी एस कोर एंड जेनरलीपल आर से हाई आर कुछ डिफरेंट है वो गिवज यू अर गुड सेंस मेक्स ऑफ सेंस आई सिमिलर फ्रेम वर्क आई थिंक ऑलमोस्ट आइडेंटिकल एक्चुअली बट ब्रेक थ्री स्टेप इन दैट ऑर्डर द फर्स्ट स्टेप इज सम प्रोक्सी फॉर कस्टमर लव डू पीपल लव योर प्रोडक्ट और नॉट हाई एन पी एस एंड हाई रिपीट रेट ओके अगर एन पी एस कम है और रिपीट रेट कम है तो पीपल डोंट लव योर प्रोडक्ट डजेंट मैटर लाइक दोनों होने पड़ेंगे सेकेंड इज सस्टेनेबल कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन मार्जिन ओके इफ पीपल लव यूर प्रोडक्ट बट कंट्रीब्यूशन मार्जिन नेगेटिव यू डोंट हैव प्रोडक्ट मार्केट फॉर विच मीस पीपल आर नॉट विलिंग टू पे देर इज नो वैल्यू यू आर एबल जनरेट और डिमांड फॉर दैट एंड थर्ड इज प्रडिक्टेबल ग्रोथ रेट अगर वो दोनों भी है बट वो ग्रो नहीं कर रहा है डेट सम हेल्दी यू नो इन द अर्ली डेज हैज टू वेरी हाई डबल डिजिट ग्रोथ रेट्स अगर वो तीन है कंसिस्टेंटली देन इट इज द क्लासिक आई थिंक यू पुट दिस इन नाइस फ्रेम वर्क दिस इज एक्टली So let now let's zoom out. Right? I think you have obviously grown a lot as a leader. I think you have gone through you know all the classical phases of uh, you know entrepreneurship, you know various ups and downs, reinventing yourself and all of that. Today, looking back, you know how do you describe you know what is core two or three traits of you as a leader? Like you know what is your know, fundamentals of your own you know, leadership style? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's me. Uh, uh, yeah, I think if I were to just talk about what. Uh, my approach is i truly believe in empowered culture mm. in fact uh, uh, the reason why people should come to work for health yeah. is actually empowerment right well i take a lot of pride in terms of basically uh, uh, you know getting high potential people yeah. giving them the freedom just right. like an entrepreneur mm. would truly believe in and letting them blossom yeah. so basically the first trait mein kahunga wo ye hai ki ए आई ट्राई टू एड वैल्यू ओनली वेर आई कैन एंड आई एम वेरी वेरी ओके टू एक्सेप्ट कि मुझे नहीं आती चीजें ना ही मैं ऐसी मीटिंग पर जाता हूँ जहाँ पर मेरा कोई वैल्यू एड नहीं हो बट अल्टीमेटली आई एम वेरी इन्वॉल्व इन द मॉडल स्टेज आई एम इफ आई थिंक अबाउट बेसिक थिंग्स आई एम ऑलवेज लुकिंग फॉर दैट मॉडल और दैट प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग एंड वॉट इज योर अप्रोच एंड एज द मॉडल बिकम सस्टेनेबल अल्टीमेटली बट वंस आई गेट कम्फर्ट ऑन दैट and i get a comfort on somebody's leadership style then i basically start right. mm. so ultimately core thing is to create this like minded group of people right and give them the freedom and from my perspective keep looking for these mm. models right. and uh, basically grow very very simple okay super clear so empowered culture you know get uh, high caliber people and give them autonomy and freedom and, and don't try to add value where you can't don't try, that's <laughs> very important yeah i think you know sometimes the leader because you have the you know people call that hippo culture uh yeah. it's something stands for you know i think highest paid individuals opinion okay. and you know a lot of companies have that right you know because whoever is the senior most person you know they tend to hog all the talk time and no matter how much you know empowered culture you are trying to create but ultimately junior people are not speaking up i think because this is okay sorry krishna nahi woh bola tha you know it's a knowing what you're saying that, that uh, where you can't add value or stepping out of that you know some it's a very important like pulling back is as important as you know leaning in and participate at the same time very very curious i think to uh, basically main kisi saath baithu aur main sawal nahi push kar raha hai ki kyun kar raha hai kaise kar raha hai kya kar raha hai but uh, but ultimately uh, agar main ek uh, simple se correlation karu मेरी कंपनी में मेरे को लगता है मेरा कैलेंडर सबसे ज्यादा खाली रहता है hmm. तो मुझे कभी भी कोई भी कोई बोलता है मैं तो खाली हूँ बिकॉज आई स्पेंड मोस्ट ऑफ माई टाइम ब्रेन स्टॉमिंग और ट्राइंग टू बिकॉज देर ऑलवेज थ्री टू फोर क्वेश्चन एंड आई एम कॉन्स्टेंटली सर्चिंग फॉर दैट डायरेक्शन बिकॉज आई बिलीव दैट दो मॉडल्स कैन अनलॉक अ सिग्निफिकेंट अमाउंट ऑफ वैल्यू Uh, while you have to maintain the right balance on execution, but basically execution le once you are comfortable with the team, so that's broadly the style. Again, I think you are indicating something uh, looks simple, but I think a very very powerful thing. I think most leaders should have empty calendar. If your calendar and anyway everyone you know watching this can check. If your calendar is full, as per you are a senior leadership position, which means you are doing things that a lot of other people in your team should be doing. Either you are not hiring right, 
or you are not able to let go you are not empowering or training people and the worst of all is you have no time to zoom out and look at a big picture you are just you know lost in the everyday nitty gritty and details yeah. so i think at some point you know i start to grow in the middle management zone so your calendar sort of fill up yeah. at some point learning and pulling back and you know the calendar should show bell curve <laughs> otherwise you know you are kind of just stuck in that in you know, too much or fire fighting no, your thing. thinking time has to be high and it has to be high quality thinking right yeah, so yeah. that is uh, so you have a you know very enviable position you know as far as you know muscle blazer health card is concerned right you are in control of destiny you know very well capitalized profitable considered growing you know uh, number of market share so like what happens next 5 years you know what are your dreams and aspirations so basically look i uh, so as i was saying that i feel lucky that we have gotten to a scale yeah. which can allow us to sustain ourselves that was the number one goal mm-hmm. basically now i feel that this is a great opportunity uh, in terms of basically scaling the platform to the next level so a i am working on uh, getting the profitability in place uh, overall for next year second i also feel that uh, there's a great opportunity to take some of the proprietary technology that we have built internationally that can increase uh, the reach of the platform and want to basically do that and third thing that i'm working on is basically we are also looking for some partnerships strategic partnerships if possible in this space so ultimately the goal is i am looking at this as a 10 year journey yeah. and we want to be the largest platform in nutrition and keep partnering and keep making it big so very very simple goals now not fancy you know it's outstanding is you know quite relatable also from cult vantage point i think see the good thing is about obviously you know you want to build a large business i want cult to be large business but i think we are also playing a very active role in shaping the evolution of fitness in the country sure. like i have you know and like you also have been very deep believer that fitness is very important for people you know people need to be active they need to move so which means whatever you know you can do something at home or you can go for a jog or go to a gym and you know have right nutrition and somewhere you know supplementation through you know whey protein etc is an important part of that so i think the impact also on the lives of you know literally millions of people is also very exciting part of this yeah. journey you know going ahead i uh, just so you you started your own personal fitness journey very very early <laughs> Have you kept up with that fitness journey? Uh, like how has been? I'm going to be honest. Look, uh, Mukesh, you're way there. <laughs> I've, I've been, uh, I've been. Uh, so look, I've been consistent, but the forms of fitness, the rigor is uh, kind of mellowed down significantly. So, uh, so I follow a very simple home workout routine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically, uh, I have like this basic. Uh, I do a lot of push-ups. Yeah. I do uh, squats and I do sit-ups. So basically, I do three right. kind of uh, exercises yeah. in the morning. and then i picked up walking quite a bit right. uh, this happened during the covid phase uh-huh. so i consistently do like maybe 10 to 15000 right. steps every day oh, 10 oh, to 15000 okay. basically and i've done like maximum i've done like 30000 steps okay. also so right. basically i just yeah. love walking and thinking so i think from general health and fitness corner that's great you know basically what you're saying is you are active throughout the day you are walking your move their movement is there and you are doing some resistance training using mostly your body weight right you know which gets the job done but when you look back your old pictures of 18 inch biceps you don't feel like <laughs> i never got to the 18 inch biceps are sir 17 yeah theek hai <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> yeah. <laughs> but ek ek inch badal ke tum i know i know it's still though guys okay a uh, 15 16 for you but uh, don't feel tempted to one day rebuild uh, kidna uh, that uh, and use muscle blaze i used to get there uh, i i don't think it's going to happen now are kyun nahi hoga bol kar sakte ho chalu karte hain mujhse but yeah no no definitely i am uh, big proponent of strength training is quite important in general i think there's a misconception that basically you know uh, it becomes difficult difficult with age but actually it's more and more important i guess so no no absolutely and i mean i track you know generally the world of longevity one of the things that people are now propagating a lot is you know as you age maintaining muscle mass is one of the biggest indicator of slowing down aging yeah. so especially i think people in their 40s 50s 60s having some kind of resistance training is super important other thing is people who have never done resistance training you know i mean as as we talked earlier you see gains very fast first time you know lift a dumbbell or a barbell yeah. start doing you are very light bit just within 2 3 months you start to see change i think so it's a i think resistance training is for everybody irrespective of the age okay one question for you look basically obviously uh, uh, you know one change that i've seen in you like 25 years ago mm-hmm. versus this 
this whole discipline hmm. i think uh, you know i was not disciplined to do you know you were disciplined <laughs> but you were very tempted with one passion right. and yeah. sort of super super uh, deep into that right but this whole discipline of uh, and i'm super impressed with this whole fitness discipline hmm. that you maintained right. for i don't know how many years now yeah. uh, so basically what Uh, like how have you is it like very very conscious effort that you have to do to kind of do this? I think it's definitely conscious effort at some point you know see you start to understand the underlying fundamental principles you know one of the and we talked earlier also this whole idea of compounding the compounding I think is the most powerful principle I think you know operating because anything big you know whether you even look at even evolution you know it's also function of compounding I think I think Einstein is supposed to have said that you know one of the biggest miracle of universe is you know compound interest you know anything you compound you know so i realize once it clicked clear ye sab kuch long term mein hota hai aur the only way anything compound you have to be consistent day after day for that then you arrive at you know habit so at some point i looking into like how do you deliberately cultivate habit in fact we are actually doing a one full episode on just habit building right you know and these are topic i'll talk more about and at some point in i as you know like i i get tempted with projects i want to do more thing but realize ki time to limited hai the only way to do that is continue deliberately investing your productivity so that has been a kind of hobby interest for me last 15 years you know i've looked into it and boil it to something simple i think you have to cultivate you know see discipline is very difficult i think habits are easy agar habit ban jati hai to apna hote rehta hai so i think that's probably the more anchor but i have built you know today just for me it's autopilot i'm so at 6 baje i'm in the gym it doesn't matter kya chal raha hai but jaise people who do entrepreneurship and all that look it's it's a pretty rough journey at least in the first few years and you know it's like Time is limited. You have to do everything, and to scale your fitness or sub which right. the back burner is at you. What 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 do you tell these people? See, I think again, what I learned, I also initially tried to do long hours, etc. But thoda sa na when you introspect and realize, I realize that it's not that I am producing more. If I work fifteen, sixteen hours, eventually realize that my you know uh, efficiency started to drop off after ten hours. The quality of thinking goes for a toss. Sometimes even temper goes for a toss. You know, you're just the <laughs> not to, you know not absorbing so it appears from a distance you're putting in all those hours yeah. but effectiveness is not there so for me sweet spot is like if i can get 8 to 10 hours of high quality time yeah. my output is no question it's way better than if i somehow slog for 15 16 hours yeah so i think for the foreseeable for longest period of time i think i i don't work more than 10 hours mm-hmm. obviously there are sometimes you know the fire fighting situation people sure. will stretch i think that you know when you understand neuroscience of brain how our brain works right it's just we don't have the able to focus and concentrate on something for many many hours at a time no one can do it yeah. like even you know really top caliber people they will do very intense amount of work for few hours yeah. and recharge their brain i think after i realize that and also more intuitive understanding so personally for me i don't see need i would rather you know to can again use this i think abraham lincoln quote right you know if you give me an Six hours to chop down a tree. I'll use five hours to sharpen the saw. I think that applies to all our work also. There's no point, you know, just take a blunt instrument, keep hacking, you know, six yeah. hours, you know, <laughs> yeah. this is not going to make progress. Yeah. No, it's a great advice because uh, people need to definitely not, uh, you know, maintain a balance in like right. this and sleep uh, to have a sustained journey. Yeah, and it's like you were talking about virtuous cycle. Right? I think there's a great virtuous cycle in this. You know, when you sleep well, you work out in the morning. You're so pumped up and charged up when you go to work. Your mind is clear. Yeah. you are not affected by the stress so it's not that you know that time is taking away from your productivity yeah. is adding back you know with the interest of your productivity so i don't think there is a choice ki ya to ye kar sakte hai wo kar sakta hai thing so i think you know this uh, idea we are talking about of you know compounding habit i'm pretty sure like you couldn't have gotten here where you are you know without having some habits to go back to so if you reflect back on your own life what are those critical habits which has played a you know, big role in you know achieving you know what you have achieved? so i think fitness habit or that mm-hmm. always you know uh, some routine right. sort of uh, take your sort of mind off uh, and basically consistently at least keep coming back to this yeah. has certainly stayed with me overall uh, second i think uh, uh, i'm i'm generally not taken to much of stress overall right and my approach on solving problem i don't know if it categorizes a habit or whatever but basically sometimes you tend to over react when mm. you think oh yeah. and you get like you know, you know basically you, i'm not very very quick to react mm. i'm always like take things yeah. absorb and then basically within you know 3 4 days basically you know, take a patient approach in terms of solving this yeah uh and then other than that basically you know uh, there's also 
a uh, little bit of travel habits and all that which right. is taken which sort of uh, earlier on i used to think like basically all your time needs to go here yeah. but uh, i'm still i believe that i'm still reasonably workaholic but right. still uh, i think there's the balance of these three four right. things well, i think it's mostly mostly this one so i think most of your know, habits are around you know consistency and calm and composure you know yeah. not getting you know just too carried away in the yeah. moment and that probably leads to just overall patiently doing the right things so or most of the feedback that i get is i'm quite patient yeah. so i uh, because i've seen some people like react very quickly and right. i just feel that yeah. you know you know the world is going to come to an end yeah. but uh, but i think that uh, that has certainly helped me sort of maintain a long term yeah you know, you know people say patience is virtue and especially if you want to try to do something in you know, a long period of time it does require a lot of patience and equanimity i think sabir has been you know fascinating conversation i think you know health card and muscle base i think are absolutely a role model companies for anyone trying to build d2c brands i think is built based on fundamentals you know deep consumer insights lot of deep product work you know leading all the way up to i think 15 patents now right you know you guys are doing cutting edge research you know it's probably in the nutraceutical space i think very few people in the country are doing you also build the business very patiently yeah. you know over a period of time where it's you know, steadily growing you know hit profitability and just quietly continue gain market share i think there is no doubt that you know you guys will have probably i don't know 40 50% market share in due course and this will you know continue to compound over a very long period of time i think i see it's a you know crossing 1000 crores is one milestone yeah. but you know over long term it is going to be you know many many thousands of crores worth you know and very meaningful valuable company i think i can see the way you build a company is a reflection of your personality you are very thoughtful about things you know deliberate you are not trying to optically manage things or trying yeah. to you know project up any image i think uh, uh, in consumer brands i personally believe that there's no shortcut right. and i think if you uh, have reasonable sort of resources in terms yeah. of capital and all that uh, i think the big differentiator for a lot of these brands is take a long term view versus nice. be forced to take a short term view yeah so clearly that I in fact i'm very excited about the cult business also because yeah. i think these two businesses sort of go hand in hand yeah. that you and eventually i think there's a long journey for india in no, no, the no, yes absolutely i think i'm pretty sure a lot of cult users are very heavy <laughs> users of muscle blaze and you know that should uh, continue but also you know just you know, i think there are a lot of people are interested in building all kind of d2c brands i think uh, muscle blaze is one very strong case study i think everyone should look it up pay attention to that i think there are a lot of lessons to learn from that you know i think you are very generous with sharing you know your journey and your learning and insights as great also to you know get hold of you and look back and reflect on all the memories some we could discuss some we couldn't we we'll save it for some other time but uh, thanks so much amit for taking that time no, no, thanks for inviting me mukesh really exciting and i'm really excited about this platform also i think uh, you are inviting people across multiple industries great learning for understanding how these industries work absolutely i'm having a lot of fun thank you so much thanks At Sparks, we aim to bring to you stories of exponential impact. We share in-depth analysis of what goes behind success stories. If you find our conversations interesting, you can join us by subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can also listen to Sparks on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or any other audio platform of your choice. If you have any suggestions on who we should invite or what topics we need to cover, just let us know in the comments. We are always listening, looking for ways to improve, and keep getting better as we go along.